Good evening. The Landmarks Board meeting is called to order at 6.03 p.m. Welcome to the October 12th, 2022 Landmarks Board meeting. And I'd like to introduce our moderator, Brenda Rittenauer. Before we begin the meeting, Brenda will review the virtual meeting decorum. Good evening, everyone. Thank you again for joining us. I am with our communication and engagement team at the city. Um, I recognize many of your names, so I know many of you have seen these slides before and ask your patience while we go through them again, in case we're joined by some folks who have not, um, who are not as familiar with them. Um, the city has engaged with community members to co-create a vision for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations. And this vision is designed to support the physical and emotional safety for community members, staff, board and commission members, and as well as supporting democracy for people of all ages, all identities, lived experiences, and political perspectives. Um, you can read much more about this vision and the process, process we went through to get to it um, by going to bouldercolorado.gov and in the search bar, searching the words productive atmospheres. Next slide, please, Claire, or Aubrey, whoever is sharing slides, thank you. Um, the following are examples of rules of decorum found in the Boulder Revised Code and in other guidelines that will support this vision and they will be upheld during tonight's meeting. All remarks and testimony shall be limited to matters related to city business. No participant shall make threats or use other forms of intimidation against any person. Obscenity, racial epithets, and other speech and behavior that disrupts or otherwise <coughs> the ability to conduct the meeting are prohibited. And participants are required to display their full name, not to sign up to speak at this particular meeting, but to display their whole name, um, the name they're commonly known by, before being allowed to speak. Only audio testimony is permitted. Um, if we don't see your name, then um, your full name, I will reach out to you in the chat or by phone um, to help you get that name displayed. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us once again, Brenda. I do want to acknowledge that we have a full quorum tonight, although one of our board members is currently may have his camera turned off. And as well, I want to welcome our liaison from the planning board. Um, as with in-person Landmarks board meetings, the recording of this meeting will be available in the record archives no later than 28 days from this meeting. And new tonight, our meetings will be um, appearing on the YouTube channel three days after the meeting. So before we begin, in earnest, I'd like to do a roll call and introductions. I'll begin myself. I'm Abby Daniels, chair of the Landmarks board. Uh, Bill? I'm Bill Jellick, um, Landmarks Board member. Chelsea. Hi, Chelsea Castellano, Landmarks Board member. John. John Decker, Landmarks Board member. Ronnie. Ronnie Pelusio, Landmarks Board member. And I may have my video off for a period of this. Um, I shared this when the, before the meeting kicked off, but I am not feeling great today. Um, don't have COVID. But uh, I'm not sure how long I can hang out for the meeting, so I'm going to bear through as much as I can, um, and I'll let you guys know if I have to bail. Um, and then for those of you that are seeing, I'm going to shut my video off for the duration, but I will be in, in the background here um, participating. Thank you, Ronnie, and we do appreciate as much time as you're um, able to give us tonight. And last but certainly not least, Laura. Laura Kaplan. I'm the liaison from the planning board. I do not vote on Landmarks Board. Thank you, Laura. We know that people who are here to participate tonight may have strong emotions about certain projects. We want to hear from you and we found it more productive if you are speaking to persuade us rather than either berating us, staff, or any applicants present tonight. We will be following the usual format as best we can. Owners and applicants have agreed to use this format beforehand. And as with regular Landmarks board meetings, you may only speak at the appropriate time during public participation or at the appropriate time during the public hearings. Requests to speak outside of these times will be denied. There are some quasi-judicial and legislative 
hearing. So we'll go through that process with each of the three hearings tonight. And um, everybody speaking tonight will need to be sworn in. As board chair, I will do a roll call vote for any motions that are made throughout the evening. Now, I believe we're ready to once again share the group of agreements that we came up with our at our board retreat on July 25th. And this is just a reminder to be um, cognizant of throughout this meeting and future meetings. It um, is always a living document and subject to change and we'll continue to welcome open dialogue. And board members are you welcome to use the raised hand feature to introduce a new topic, but we'll also be calling on board members by name. So the first agenda item tonight is the approval of the September minutes. Does anyone have any changes or alterations to the September meeting minutes? Seeing none, I move that we approve these minutes. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, Bill Jellick seconds the motion. We'll do a roll call vote, Bill. Aye. Chelsea. Aye. John. Aye. Ronnie. Aye. And I vote aye, so the minutes are approved unanimously for the September meeting. Now it's time to move on for public participation for items not on the agenda. Um, and you'll see, I, I also want to give a shout out to Claire and Aubrey for once again adding to our PowerPoint presentation tonight, as well as the one emailed this afternoon that you've given us the timeframes that we're hoping to accomplish the different agenda items with. So I do appreciate that. For public participation, you will be sworn in and you will be asked to state your full name. <laughs> This is the time for anybody who has any comments they'd like to make regarding 1804 Mapleton Avenue, because even though it's an update on our agenda this evening, it's not a public hearing tonight. So with that said, Brenda, are you seeing any members of the public who would like to speak at this time? I am, we do have three, four members of the public at the moment. And I invite others who are interested in speaking to raise your hand at this time. Um, so if we're ready to begin, Abby, then we can start with Catherine Barth, followed by Lynn Siegel. All right, and as you all know, Catherine and Lynn, you'll have three minutes to speak when it's your turn. And I will swear you in, Catherine, if you will raise your right hand and swear to tell the full truth to the board, you may begin. And if we could have the timer, Aubrey, that would be great. Um, okay, I guess you're hearing me. Good evening, board. And um, I'm very happy to be speaking to you tonight. Um, I am want to address 1804 Mapleton Avenue. Uh, it's a little um, vernacular house. And I was in um, the library, I was in Carnegie Library, I think last week, and I happened to look at the um, Sanborn maps. And the Sanborn maps do not cover this part of Boulder until 1906. And um, in 1906, and I, I took a photo of the map for 1906 and 1910, and I could send them separately if that would be of interest to the board. But in 1906, this little house appears along with some other built, you know, the other buildings in the immediate neighborhood. And at that time, its front porch is, uh, is there, uh, about the, it's the same, and the size of the building looks the same. And at that time in 1906, there's a little back porch at the back of the building, which is similar to the front porch, a little indented porch. And then what is very interesting is that by 1910, four years later, somebody has changed the location of the back porch. And I just found that kind of, kind of endearing 
that I don't know if they put it to the side. So that porch by 1910 is where the little side porch is now. And I was just wondering if maybe that's the point that it became a two unit house, um, a little duplex, or I, I don't know, but it was, I found that just very charming. And <clears throat> of course the house has a very prominent position on the corner there. And um, it's got you know, a lot of original features. It's what, if it were in a district or if we were really analyzing it, we might call it contributing restorable, but it is a very fine little building and it's been there adding character to that corner and to the park for a very long time uh, to the neighborhood before there was a park. Um, so I would, um, encourage the, the Landmarks Board to uh, continue with your process of landmarking. And um, I would, you know, if I could speak to the owners, I'd say, look, why don't you just landmark this little building? Uh, bring it forward yourself. So anyway, that's my comment on 1804. And whoops, I'm running out of time. Thank you. You are, but thank you, Catherine. We appreciate it. Okay, next, Lynn Siegel, if you will. Um... Yeah, please have a video window uh, with the timer in it, not the whole timer and not filling the whole window. Sure. And also, uh, Lynn will be followed by Patrick O'Rourke and then by Crystal Gray. Just want to make sure they had a heads up. Okay, Lynn, um, you'll have your three minutes, and if you would uh, raise your hand and swear, swear to tell the board the full truth. Yeah, first I needed to know, could I have a video window with my timer in it, please? I need to see your faces when I'm speaking to you. Yes, Lynn, the timer starts immediately when we turn it on, so we like to wait until people start to turn on the timer. Right, but will it fill a, one of the video windows? It will fill one of the video windows. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, I swear to whatever you want to swear me to. Um, yeah, my concern, as you all know, if you've read any of my letters, which you probably haven't, is 770 circle. And I feel this was very, I, I feel it's like obscene, and I don't use that word lightly, that this was passed through at LDRC as a demolition. Um, I looked at the historic images close up much better than what I saw during the LDRC. And that it, that's the only house in the whole front range that looked like uh, in 1941 when it was built. And it's basically the same footprint of the house. And it's a Huntington, Jones and Hunter um, architects building. And it had those rounded things in the back. I mean, you should go up there. It's obscene that anyone with landmarks, even if it went to landmarks board, would would allow this thing to be demolished. It's 8,000 square feet, $6.1 million, 1.29 acres. And it has a huge tree house in the back, uh, an atrium, what do you call it? A atrium thing. Um, it's a actually got a right of way for neighbors to go right through the front of the house, along the outside of the house. Um, and that's going to be problematic if it's Jeff Bezos that's bought the place that's demoing it. And I heard from someone putting up a $4 million house, although I find that to be low cost. But the issue here is that these kind of structures can't be threatened like this. I mean, this is like Sam Weaver approving 311 Mapleton, and he's a firefighter. And that development for senior housing is, uh, is fuel for burning down this historic neighborhood of Mapleton. That should never have been allowed either. Um, and then he betrayed us on the municipalization. And of course, the worst betrayal is CU South, which you should do something about because that also affects you and landmarking and the pressure of growth on Boulder against these older homes being preserved. Um, I just can't believe that Floral Park where some woman wanted some windows that she was willing to pay $30,000 for that same day was passed through to Landmarks Board. Like that's questionable. 
she was trying to improve her place. And now she's going to be cold till December when it goes to Landmarks Board. And this 8,000 square foot estate built of rock, built of flagstone and stucco and no wood almost. It's fireproof on the open space, basically, very close to it, was just passed for demolition. I'm outraged. I'm stunned that this could happen with in Boulder. But, you know, that's what you do. That's what you do. Uh, Lynn, thank you so much, but your time has expired. So next, I believe it's Patrick O'Rourke. It is Patrick O'Rourke, followed by Crystal Gray, and then it will be Leonard Siegel. Sorry, I just pushed the wrong button there. Patrick, you should be able to unmute now. And Patrick, if you would be kind I enough to do. swear to tell the board the full truth. Thank you. Um, I swear to, uh, my name is Patrick O'Rourke. I swear to tell the whole truth. In this particular case, I think I agree with Lynn, I mean, who just spoke, because we, we feel that that property that Lynn just talked about, I think, and I addressed 770 Circle, might have been one of those properties that should have been reviewed by the whole board. Um, but that behind us, that's why now I'm calling. But I do know that I've heard from several people that how could this happen under our watch? And meaning historic boulders watch. And it's, the answer is we didn't know about it. Um, I'm down in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I actually had the opportunity to meet with the Santa Fe Historic uh, Foundation. And to me, it becomes even more critical that um, Santa Fe exists in my opinion, on art and historic preservation, or what I would call historic tourism. And so everything that ever comes up, um, if anything, we need to be advocates on a, on a regular basis to always be putting forward historic preservation. The reason I bring that forward is um, last week or two weeks ago, Catherine Barth and I spoke, both spoke at the Parks and Rec Board, and we requested that Allie and Marcy put together a schedule so that we don't get caught off guard like we did last year or with the, uh, the Banshell expansion with the Parks and Recreation Board stating that, oh, we didn't know about it or we didn't get enough notice or James Hewitt, quite honestly, dropped the ball and he took ownership of that mistake. Those mistakes in the world I came from get you fired. So what I would like to do is have a calendar, and I talked with Marcy about this a few months ago, have a calendar that starts in January, one that finishes by the third quarter of 2023, so we can bring it forward to the city council that voted on the Banshell expansion and that promoted the idea that we should be able to put together a civic um, historic district. I think this is our opportunity. Bill, you said at one of the meetings, historic boulder step up to the plate. I'm doing that today. And I would hope that one of you would raise your hand and say, I'll take ownership on the landmark board and, and move forward. Um, because that's number one on our agenda. Uh, I also, and Catherine also spoke uh, uh, last week at the Boulder County HAP, HPAB or whatever, about the projects we have going. And currently we have about nine or 10 projects going on throughout Boulder, Colorado. And I'll just highlight them for you which is um, we're working with them on the nine mile markers. It's a long-term project be done in th uh, two or three years. Uh, I'm in the process of um, getting some, oh God, what was it? Um, and I'm running out of time, so I shouldn't do it. Uh, the Billings Ranch, we just got approved. Um, nine mile markers. Oh, and, uh, and I'll just extend it through and then I'll continue on later. Uh, I'm working on the Belmont School over on 63rd and Belmont and I appreciate just a couple extra seconds. And that building's looking good and I'm hoping to get that uh, started this year. And the last one is um, the Tommy Jones Stagecoach. And if you're not familiar with it, it's the oldest building in Boulder County and it is in the process of falling down. And so I talked with the, uh, Boulder County last week about demolition by neglect and they've agreed to work with me. Um, thank you guys. And I'm looking forward to working with you. Thank you, Patrick. And Crystal Gray. Hi there, can you hear me? We can and Crystal, I know you know you get three minutes to speak and if you'd be kind enough 
to uh, swear to tell us the whole truth and then state your full name. I Thank do um, <laughs> promise to tell you the whole truth. My full name is Crystal Gray. I reside at 1709 Spruce. I'm a Whittier resident. And I wanted to speak to you about 1804 Mapleton. It's a small house, as Catherine said, that has a big kind of horrendous addition on the back. But it's on a prominent corner of 18, of Mapleton and 18th Street. And on the 18th Street side, there is a little mini park that was actually developed as part of a transportation project, which I think is really um, something Landmark should think about, the settings and transportation. But anyway, I'd like to encourage you to schedule a hearing on whether to have a demolition hearing on this and not just decide tonight, but take input. And um, I was on council for eight years and then I was on planning board and was a liaison to landmarks. And so I appreciate the, the details that um, and the code that landmarks followed. Um, Whittier has a pattern of small houses in the neighborhood that have a hysteric character, but have been added onto on the back. It's a really common pattern. In fact, it may, excuse me. Oh, in fact, at Mapleton and 20th on the Southwest corner, and we'll send you some pictures on this, um, a house was landmarked over the objection of the owners. And it what it is now beautiful, nicely restored. I mean, this happened a number of years ago, and it's also got an ADU on the alley, which is really great. So it's got essentially two units. Um, although this isn't part of your discussion um, tonight or would be about this house, but I'd like to see, and I'd like to help to work on this, more flexibility for landmarks to be able to offer subdivisions of properties for houses that have historic significance. So yeah, I'd like to have you schedule a hearing on this where we can talk about the um, the the um, assets and the significance of these of this house at 1804. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Crystal, and thank you for reminding me personally about the John Frakes house at 20th and Mapleton that I know um, not only became a very successful save, but he opened it up to historic Boulder one year for a holiday house tour. Um, Brenda, anyone else from the public who would like to speak? We, oh, do. we have yeah. two more. We have Leonard Siegel followed by, oh, Georgia Chamberlain's hand was up for a moment, but now it's down. So Georgia, let us know if you would like to speak. There we go, back up. So we have Leonard followed by Georgia. So Leonard, you should be able to unmute now. Thank you. Can you hear me? Y yes. And Leonard, if you would be kind enough to swear to you tell the whole truth. Yes. Um, I swear to tell the whole truth. And my name is Leonard Siegel. I'm the executive director of Historic Boulder, but I'm speaking tonight as a private citizen, a preservationist, and as an, as an architect, because my comments have not been reviewed by the board. So it really doesn't, uh, it's not really kosher for me to represent this being commentary from the board, but it comes from me and comes from my heart. Um, we're trying to figure out a really good way for preservationists to work with the Landmarks Board and the Landmarks Planners. In the past, uh, people like Marcy Gerwing have reached out to people like me to ask for feedback on projects that are coming before the board and before the planners. Uh, a case in point was the um, Harvest House Hotel, and then in August, I called Marcy and spoke with her to about a variety of different projects that are coming up in 2023 uh, for landmarks. And, um, and she, in passing, said, oh, by the way, it looks like 770 Circle Drive, do you know that project, that property is going to be, it, it could be coming up for a demolition request. And so we took a look at that project together, that building together, and I thought we were in an understanding that while the building had been modified over the years, the bones of it were st still very intact. So from an architectural point of view, there was a way to restore it back to 
the original if you wanted to. Also historically, it was important because it represented the work of the pioneers of modernism in Boulder, um, Glenn Huntington and, and James Hunter. But it also had some really interesting history to it because the Spackmans were um, an interesting family. Mr. Spackman was a CU professor and an author of half a dozen books. And the second owners, Mr. Caruccini, was an esteemed physicist at the National Bureau of Standards, and he worked on the Saturn V mission to the moon. So um, it was, a, I pretty much was gobsmacked that this building at LDRC was that the demolition was approved after giving what I thought was a good conversation with the landmarks planner and feeling like I was in agreement uh, and she was in agreement that the building had some strong qualities that were worth taking forward. So it's water under the bridge because the deed is done, but it should never have been done. And, and I hate to be in a situation where I feel like the conversation and the working relationship between preservationists and the landmark board and the landmark planners are in jeopardy, but it does feel that way. And I just wanted to say that, and I'm sorry to leave it on that tone, but that's, that's how preservationists are feeling right now. Thank you. Thank you, Leonard. And we have no other hands up at this time, Abby. Okay, so now, thank you everybody. Oh, oh. I'm sorry, as soon as I say that, Georgia's hand goes up and down. So Georgia, um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and open your microphone if you would like to participate at this time. If not, please just come on and let us know that, that you're good. Okay, I'm Georgia Chamberlain, the person that is technologically challenged, as you can no tell, and going up and down. But I would like to speak about uh, 900 baseline, the trash structure at Taqua, or is this not the time to do well, that? So Georgia, if, if you're available a little later, normally public comments for a public hearing would occur occur after the staff presentation and the applicant's presentation. So I don't know if you're able to join us a little later in the meeting when that occurs. That's fine. I'm just confused a little bit about it, the process here. It, it is confusing. We try to keep this portion to things not on the agenda. And that is one of our public hearings a little later this evening. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And with that, I think we are safe to close open comment for tonight. So um, we will close the public hearing. Thank you to everyone who took the time and effort to join us tonight and speak. You know, normally we would move right on to the discussion of landmark alteration and the statistical report and so forth. But I think because of some of the comments tonight, even though we can um, table them until under matters, I. I feel if it's okay with staff and Lucas and KJ, I just wanted to see if any of our board members had really brief, quick um, responses they wanted to share with what the public has um, commented on tonight. John, I don't know if you have anything or Bill. I have one quick thing. Um, I would just like to um, come back to Patrick's comments, and I would be very interested to work more with Historic Boulder, particularly on the specific project of the Banshell District. And um, so let's get in touch at some point. Thank you, John. Um, any other board members have something they want to share briefly at this point? I have my hand up. Are you going to recognize it? Sometimes things don't show up on, on this format in my screen, but uh, Bill, please go ahead. Yeah, no, I have nothing to, no comments to add. Although, I will say I was one of the board members that sat on the review of uh, that Circle Drive property, and I have no problem with my decision. Thank you, Bill. Um, Ronnie or Chelsea, anything 
at this point? Yeah, I just wanted to say um, that I know that um, the ban shell conversation has been a sensitive topic and the potential district around that has come up several times. And it would be great, I think, to hear from staff at some point about, you know, the work plan for next year or this year, well, next year, and how it relates to that. But obviously, we've collectively expressed that it's an area of focus, and we're hearing that from some of our colleagues. Um, so I, I just wanted to point that out. Um, we hear you, Patrick. Thank you for stepping up and being as vocal as you have been in tonight's meeting. Um, I do think that kind of um, advocacy and um, approach is healthy for us. I'm, I'm not sure if that's exactly what Bill was asking for, but it is really great. So please continue to do that. And I hear you. Um, I also just wanted to kind of echo something that Crystal Gray brought up that um, personally, I think is something worth exploring that we've talked about in the past. Um, that is a version of um, incentive, another version of an incentivization tool for um, preservation that she was saying might have to do with um, subdivision. Um, whether or not it is applicable for the Mapleton project, um, that is something that I have seen used in the past, um, used in neighboring communities. Um, and I think it, as you've heard me say, hits many of um, the points that we're collectively interested in, um, not only about preservation, but preservation of the small, um, and then, you know, in tandem, other citywide objectives that may have to do with affordable affordability. Um, and I think the carrot version of that, which is a subdivision approach, um, should be explored at some point. I know we've got a lot to do next year, but Crystal, I appreciate you speaking to that topic. Um, and also think that is a tool worthy of uh, continuing to look at. Thank you, Ronnie. And I don't know, Chelsea, if you have anything. Um, we do have an ambitious agenda tonight. Um, I'm good. Thank you. But and I and to the staff, thank you for taking letting me take kind of this liberty, this point of privilege, because I think all of the speakers of public participation raised important points. And I know sometimes we discuss them later in matters or you know after this meeting. And I wanted to do the courtesy to let them know. I think Rhonda, you said it best. We heard all of you. We appreciate what you said and bringing these things to our attention. So thank you. Uh, with that being said, I think we're um, ready to move on to the statistical report for September. And Claire, I believe I'm handing it all over to you right now. Yeah, I just want to check in with Bill really quickly. You still have your hand raised, but I don't know whether it's... Oh, thank you. Thank you for seeing. I appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to respond to Ronnie. Uh, Ronnie, I honestly don't remember what I said regarding asking for... Um, historic boulder to step up but anytime they can step up and help with the uh, gargantuan problems that this city is facing regarding its its historic preservation program i'm certainly in favor of it so keep coming patrick we appreciate it thanks bill All right. So oh, speaking of gargantuan problems, here's our statistical report for September. Um, blue, as usual, are our LACs, and the pink and purple are the demo reviews. Um, this dark purple uh, right here um, is a pre-1940 demo that was reviewed and approved at the LDRC. Uh, we reviewed and approved 11 LACs in September. Uh, four were approved by staff, which were, you know, roofing and AC units, the usual stuff. Um, one was actually a fire restoration project in the Chamberlain Historic District. Um, seven total were reviewed and approved at LDRC, and um, five were approved without additional review, which is a positive improvement. Um, only one needed additional LDRC review and one needed additional details, which came to staff. 
Uh, we approved 13 demo requests, two of them, uh, the dark purple were reviewed by the LDRC. Um, and uh, I brought some of the staff reviews to LDRC last month for a second set of eyes, which was um, very helpful with Marcy out. Um, so Faith and I are doing what we can to research and approve administrative post-1940 demo requests, um, but sometimes your experience is really valuable. Um, and we don't always have a lot of written documentation for post 1940s buildings. So I appreciate your patience when we do that. Um, so this is the year so far. We have, uh, as you can see, a lot of, a lot of demos still. Um, we had uh, 288 reviews up to this point in, um, in 2020. Uh, 290 up to this point in 2021 and 249 um, reviews so far this year. So we are we are close, but no record year, understandably. So this is our chart for new applications compared with the last two years. We've reviewed and processed 31 new applications um, this month, and. Um, I'm struggling to see any trends this year other than uh, other, other than we have a lot of new applications to get through and that just that line just keeps going up and down. And again, this is the uh, uh, against the six year average for new applications. Um, we're actually above average this month for new applications here. Our average is usually 27 and we were at um, 31 new applications and I think that October is actually going to be busy because um, I, I've seen a lot come in and just in the last week. So any questions on the statistical report? Oh, okay. Well, then I will move on. Um, we have a a public hearing scheduled tonight for 568 14th Street, which was our other stay of demolition that we were um, that we have we had <laughs> on the books. Um, so I will um, postpone that one, and my update is just for 1804 Mapleton. Um, so the applicant for 1804 Mapleton Avenue uh, withdrew the demolition application. Um, which means there's no longer a stay of demolition on this house. Um, we did manage to confirm that the house was on this lot before 1889. So it's at least 10 years older than we previously thought. Um, we have a, uh, a hearing, an initiation hearing was scheduled for November 2nd at the last Landmarks Board meeting. Um, and that hearing did include um, an alternative to issue the demo permit, um, but now this would not be considered as there's no demolition request. So the Landmarks Board can still hold the initiation hearing as scheduled. Um, you can cancel it or you can postpone it to a later date since there's no deadline now imposed by the stay. Um, so did anyone have any questions for me before you got into a scheduling discussion. I don't have any. Okay. So, so Claire, just to reiterate before us tonight is the decision. Um, we're no longer having to make a decision by December 5th. So if um, the board did want to have an initiation hearing, it could be held at the December meeting or even later than that, correct? That is correct, yeah. And the reason I asked that, I could see depending on how the board is leaning is um, there could be an, an advantage to waiting till maybe a later meeting because Marcy would be back and we'd have a full complement of preservation staff on board. Um, so I think we should have a discussion about this and primarily focused on the scheduling and not the merits. Uh, Bill, would you like to start off? Um, I'd like to actually see 
did we schedule a um 9-11-3 discussion for tonight or is that what we were setting up now i think we scheduled that for november 2nd and we scheduled it for november 2nd because the meeting had to be held by december 5th and i believe our december board meeting is on the 6th yeah okay okay um no then i don't have any discussion um other than um what might inform us uh, for our November 2nd meeting might be the decision we made on just a recent demolition withdrawal um, where we all decided that because the house wasn't threatened, the property wasn't threatened, we should not go forward with uh, initiation or um, attempt to landmark. Uh, John? I'm in agreement with Bill. I think I, I think that it is at least I personally think it's somewhat outside of the board's purview to be the person or the the entity bringing an initiation in the absence of an outside one, either the owner or another group. Um, so I, I don't believe we will need to just we can discuss the need to initiate maybe, but I, I don't believe that we need to hold an initiation hearing with the withdrawn um, application. Ronnie? Yeah, I think I agree with my colleagues, but I have to say that this building in particular really seems like if it were to proceed, a very strong candidate for landmarking. So I'm a little torn about that um, because my concern is if we don't proceed with the landmark process associated with this, we won't fully vet the merits of the building um, and it could go through another process that uh, avoids you know, the demo review because of um, it falling underneath the criteria of uh, the the percentage or distance of uh, building that is not demolished. So I'm a little torn about this one. I have to say, um, if they didn't pull the demo application, I would be strongly positioned to move forward. I guess I would like to hear my other colleagues before kind of finalizing my thought process on this. Um, and I, I do recognize what Bill is saying does apply to this, but this seems much clearer of a case to me. Um, and um, so I, I, uh, I'm a little torn about what the next step is, if there is one. And I definitely have thoughts I'll share after. And Bill, I see your hand raised, but do you mind if I go ahead and call on Chelsea first? No, please go through everybody. I just wanted okay. to respond to something Ronnie said. Thank you, Chelsea. Thanks. Um, so if I understand this correctly, we are deciding on whether to set a date for an initiation hearing or, or not. Is that? Well, we do have a date. We voted unanimously okay. in September to have this date, but the date is um, we were holding that meeting. We were holding it November 2nd because it had to be held before um, our December 6th meeting, and we didn't want to arrange a, a special meeting. But go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I guess if, I, yeah, we, I mean, in the last meeting, we decided that because a demo application was withdrawn, that it wasn't necessary to move forward with a hearing because there was no threat to the building. And I, I would be inclined to use that same logic. You know, we often talk about in our meetings that, you know, we have a lot to do as a board. And I think having an additional hearing and creating the additional workload and time spent on a uh, a building where there's no threat of it being demoed to me it just doesn't seem like a good use of time. Um, but, you know, I understand the situation that we don't we don't want damage done to this house in, in the meantime, but I guess I, 
I don't really see that being an issue. I don't know what could possibly be done to this property. It's it's this piece seems relatively small. So is it possible to hear from the applicant or the applicants here on if they have any plans to do any work on the building? I don't believe they're here tonight. And Claire, I don't know if you can answer that. They were not able to make it tonight. <sighs> okay. Well, my, yeah, my inclination is to not move forward with the hearing since the demo application has been pulled. Thank you, Chelsea. And Bill and John, now I see your hand raised as well. Uh, do you want me to comment or would you two like to? No, finish, finish just putting completing. the hand up. You should okay. go ahead yeah. and comment. Complete. Yeah, I, finish, finish the I, cycle and yeah, then we'll yeah, get back. Yeah, finish, finish going through. So I, I hear what all of you have said and I value all of it. I like Ronnie am torn. I think this is different than the one that was, um, we just did not, we, we canceled having the initiation hearing and for several reasons. This is not an owner occupied building. I think this really rises to the, it meets all the criteria. And I think the other ones did too, but I think this one is a really special rare example because it's not owner occupied. And because even though the demo application application has been withdrawn, I think there's a possibility that some windows could be changed or some alterations could be made to this house, which would render it unlandmarkable. We've heard from two members of the public tonight, Catherine Barth and Crystal Gray, who are encouraging us to go ahead and hold an initiation hearing. And um, I think the, I don't know, um, I believe staff had perhaps prepared a memo for November 2nd. I know that with the one on 8th Street that was withdrawn and we decided not to hold a hearing, that staff was not for initiating that. I don't think we know what staff was going to recommend on this one, but I do, you know, Chelsea, I appreciate your comment about consistency and predictability and, and, and using the same logic. I do think there are some different factors involved in this house that would lead me personally to um, want to hold an initiation hearing. And I would think because we're not bound by a December 5th date of um, the demo permit expiring, my preference would be to hold it at the January 4th meeting when we, we have our full complement of preservation planners back on board. Uh, Bill? Um, thanks. I am. Um do think that we should still get staff's input on this property. I'd like to know more about it. It's clearly a very old property. Um, and whenever we have to do a good in-depth deep dive review on these properties, I know as a board member, that really means a lot to me. If, if I can't find a whole lot back there, um, that means something. And on the other hand, if, if a, a lot of information is brought forward that I didn't realize, that also has a bearing on it. I also want to make clear that I voted in that last meeting regarding the, the um, uh, Eighth Street property um, to go along with everyone else, but I did not vote to agree to the reasoning behind it. I don't think just because a property's demolition um, application has been removed that that removes it from its potential to be landmarked just because we perceive that the imminent danger is past, we've done a lot of work in examining these properties. And I think we should probably try to pay a little more attention to them because if they were up once for demolition, it's a good possibility they'll be up um, multiple times after that. So I'm definitely in favor of pushing a initiation hearing out so that we can get staff to do a little deep dive. And I'm okay with what you, um, mentioned as well, um, Abby, that we get uh, this done maybe you know early next year um, when when we have Marcy back and uh, not so much uh, strain on staff. Thank you, Bill John. So um, just to clarify and/or expand my 
previous not completely lucid comments. Um, I, I said, I said, I guess my quandary is based on the fact that we have established the precedent of not going forward with these things, at least in the in the tight schedule, um, we've we've set that precedent. However, I want to acknowledge that I think that the historic significance is there in this property that it needs to be examined further, um, and kind of leave it at that. Um. Thank you, John. And we do have the luxury and we should be looking at each property independently of other decisions. Uh, Ronnie, would you like to uh, speak again? Well, I guess, you know, I do think at some point we should visit this. Um, Abby, I'm not sure. I'd, I'd like to hear your statement again. Are you suggesting that we revisit this in future months? I suggest that we postpone the initiation hearing. We had already voted on it to have it in November, but I think given that we're no longer bound by the stay expiring, making taking action by December 5th, 5th then I think we can extend it. And I I appreciate um, Chelsea's comment about the staff, but I think staff has already even done a memo and has something ready to go. So I don't fear, I don't feel like it's an undue burden on staff, but I think we could also have a valuable voice back in this discussion if we wait. I believe Marcy will be attending our December um, 6th meeting, but I think to give her plenty of time to really get her arms around this and whatever staff's recommendation is, I would like to see it postponed till January 4th. Okay, um, I uh, will support that same decision, Abby. I would hate to see this thing just go away. I think one thing that makes it unique outside of its age um, is, and the, the fact that the building is relatively intact, is the exposure of the side elevation. And, you know, knowing the ways in which our demolition criteria um, allow for the modifications to these buildings and how it might in a circumstance, a potential scenario, affect the site elevation that is highly visible. Um, I believe that it makes this particularly unique and potentially sensitive for a version of demolition that doesn't, um, you know, uh, meet what I think that the standards of this building require. And that's because of the park. And I recognize that the park used to be a right of way and it's no longer a right of way. Um, but truly this building meets the criteria on multiple um, standards. Um, but I also know that it is a highly visible site elevation um, and think that this building is worthy of regrouping on. So Abby, I support what you just said. I'm not sure how to um, move forward with that if we're all kind of have a common voice on that, but I would agree with your proposed path forward. And I see Bill's hand raised again. Thank you, Abby. Does this mean then that we should revisit that um, decision and put a motion out there to um, strike down that, uh, that proposed meeting? Or reset that meeting for uh, a different date? Well, Clara or Lucas, is it as simple as making an emotion to postpone the initiation hearing for 1804 Mapleton Avenue until the January 4th meeting? Yes, it is, I believe. Oh, okay. <clears throat> yes, that's correct. That would work. Okay. And I, I don't want to stifle or cut off conversation, but if somebody is ready to make a motion, we okay, can also- I'm, I'll do it. I'll make it. I move that the Landmarks Board postpone the hearing to consider adopting a resolution to initiate the process for landmark designation pursuant to section 911.3 of the Boulder Revised Code 1981, pursuant to section 911.23, I guess that's double. Oops. <laughs> I guess we wanted to be sure we got that particular section nailed down. I think we did. Um, for 1804 Mapleton Ave Avenue, to 
be moved from November 3rd to, what was the date you proposed, Abby? I believe it's January 4th. I think it's November 2nd is when we were doing it. Okay. And I believe. Okay, to January 4th. 4th. 2023. 2023. Oh my God, already. It's I know, I know, I know. Okay. I will second that. Okay. Uh, Bobby seconded Bill's motion. So, if is there any discussion before we take a roll call vote? Okay, not seeing any. Uh, let me be sure I see no hands raised. Uh, the only, this, I do want to add a comment as maybe a point of discussion. Uh, this is not to signal that I'm in favor necessarily of landmarking this property at this point, but I do, but I am in favor of having a deeper discussion about the potential to landmark it. Thank you, which is is the whole purpose of yes, I know the initiation. Okay, so uh, roll call. Abby, I also I know that uh, Chelsea didn't raise her hand, but Chelsea, I am interested in hearing your okay. thoughts on this. If you're willing to share them, sorry to put you on the spot. If not, you can <laughs> just pass. It's fine. Yeah, thanks, Ronnie. No, I I hear what everyone's saying, and um, I think postponing the the hearing and you know, understanding the significance of this property and the concern that, you know, adjustments can be made um, that would prevent it from being landmarked in the future. I understand all that. So I, I, um, you know, will support the resolution as it stands and, you know, to initiate the process and see where we are um, once we get to that hearing. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, for roll call vote, Bill? Aye. Chelsea? Aye. John? Aye. Ronnie? Aye. And I vote aye, so the motion passes unanimously. Thank you, everybody. Um, and now I believe it's time to move to our first public hearing. Um, item 5A is a public hearing in consideration of a motion to adopt a resolution to initiate the process for landmark designation pursuant to section 9113 of the Boulder Revised Code 1981, or alternatively to issue a demolition um, approval pursuant to section 91123BRC 1981 for 568 14th Street. And right. uh, the applicants are the Landmarks Board. So we will move on to the first public hearing. I know the owners have agreed to this virtual hearing, but my understanding is they are actually in travel and will not be present tonight. Is that correct, Claire? That is, um, and I also would like to point out that um, that uh, the the reason that the this portion of the agenda item, the alternatively issue a demolition approval pursuant to 91123 BRC is crossed out is that they also have withdrawn their um, demolition um, application. So that is not part of the, um, of the discussion tonight. But we'll get so, there. I just wanted to point that out while we're still on the agenda. Right, and I apologize for reading. On my <laughs> version, it didn't quite have it crossed out yet. So my mistake, but Claire, would you like to proceed with the update about this? Yes. All right, so this initiation hearing is legislative in nature. So the um, procedure is slightly different than a quasi-judicial hearing. The board does not need to reveal any ex parte contacts, but the rest of the hearing is similar. Um, I will give a presentation and you may ask questions of me. Um, the owner typically would give a presentation and um, I believe they were going to try and send a, represent a representative um, and I don't know if he is here, but we'll address that when we get there. Um, the public hearing will be open for public comment and the board may ask questions of the public. Um, the public hearing is then closed and the board will um, deliberate and um, if appropriate, adopt a resolution to accept the landmark application. 
So this has been the process so far. Uh, the proposal for full demolition of the house was referred to the Landmarks Board on January 12th. The board placed a stay of demolition at the hearing on June 1st, and on September 7th, the Landmarks Board voted to schedule a hearing to initiate landmark designation or issue the demolition permit. Um, on October 3rd, the owners withdrew the application for full demolition. So um, as the Landmarks Board is the applicant for the initiation, um, even though the demolition application was withdrawn, we still needed to hold the initiation hearing. Um, this does, however, change the board's options slightly. Um, you only have two options tonight because the demolition application is withdrawn. The stay does not continue. Um, so if you do not initiate landmark designation, the case will be closed. Um, a decision today to not initiate doesn't affect a future decision. So designation may be initiated at a future date if the application comes up again. Um, so if full demolition was proposed in the future, the process would follow the same demolition review process and could end up exactly in this spot in at a future time. Um, option number two is the board may vote to initiate designation and a future hearing would be held um, between 60 and 180 days from today. Um, the board cannot approve the demo application because there is none. Anybody have any questions about the options or the process? Chelsea. Yeah, um, in previous um, dem or when previous people have pulled or withdrawn their demolition application, we've gotten some reasoning why. So I'm just curious if there is any level of context that you can provide. Um, they felt like they needed some additional time. I um, I thought I sent the the email, but maybe I didn't forward that. Um, and I apologize for that, but it was basically a, a request for additional time to consider their options. Um, and the board very likely will see a partial demolition request in the future um, or not if they can figure out a way to modify the house that doesn't trigger demolition, historic preservation demolition review. So, so if we would be initiating a landmark designation against the property owner's desires, I guess, if, if just to be clear. Yes. Yes, okay. they... Um, it, that wasn't clear. It wasn't clear in the memo or anywhere else that that was the case, but that's good to know. Thank you. Well, that's because, Claire, they, the uh, property owner hasn't joined with us in wanting to get this place landmarked, right? Correct. That's why we have to assume that it is against their uh, entry or their desire. Their well, well, it sounded like they sent an email to Claire expressing that. They spoke that... at the last hearing also. Um... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that. They spoke yeah. and said, that, yeah. Yeah, I remember David saying they were not interested at this point in landmarking it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, any other questions? Claire, do you see Ronnie's hand up? Oh yes, Ronnie, I don't see you, but I see your hand. That's okay. Um, Claire, um, I don't know if you can answer this just on the spot, but can you share the demolition? Um, actually, it's yeah, the trigger point for the demolition review associated with um, you know, structure like this. It, I can't remember if it was just a percentage of the building footprint or if it also had a relationship with a street facing um, elevation. This was a, an application for full demolition, um, but if the, um, the house came back for a partial demolition, what triggered that would be 
removal of more than 50% of the roof or removal of more than 50% of the exterior walls or um, removal of any portion of a street facing wall. And this, this house actually has two street facing walls because it's on a corner. Um, so those, those items would trigger a partial demolition review. Um, less than 50% of the roof, less than 50% of the exterior walls and not touching the street facing facades would not require historic preservation review. The roof criteria, um, does it apply at all to the street facing elevation piece? Did you remove 50% of a roof if it's the 50% that's the street facing piece? Or is that considered part of the elevation in some way? Uh, I think it's considered a part of the elevation up to the ridge line, visible from the public realm. Right, the street facing wall would be the wall from foundation to rafters um, of the wall. So the 50% of the roof would be entirely by area in plan view. Does that I make mean, sense? this is such a weird thing. And I, sorry to put you on the spot. Like, I don't know the answer to this. I've been on the board a long time. I don't know the answer to this thing here, which is like, is there a version where one could remove the street facing roof or modify an aspect of the, I'm calling it street facing, but the roof that's, that is associated with a, a street um, and still not modify 50% of the roof um, and do that without it coming under the review of the board. Yes. Um, and the, the example there would not apply to this house, but that would be a, a porch roof that was a shed roof or a, um, or a hipped roof that um, wouldn't have any wall associated with it. A gable roof often has a, the wall inside the gable, you know, the triangle mm -hmm. part of the gable. Um, we consider a wall, but uh, the if there was a, for example, a hipped roof over a porch or a shed roof over a porch, you could remove that. You can actually remove the entire porch. It doesn't apply to this house because this house doesn't have a porch. Okay, well, I know we're going to revisit this um, demolition criteria. Um, so, and, you know, we can get into those details. The reason I'm asking is because there's a preservation piece associated with this that I think is maybe more robust because it has two street facing elevations. Um, and so any modification to those building faces would, you know, bring it back to the board. I mean, I'm not going to assume that I know what type of modification might be made, but my understanding was they were interested in modifying the non street facing side elevation or possibly back of the building. Um, they can do anything they want. Right. But um, if they were to pursue that, the building would be in less jeopardy of, uh, you know, um, it no longer being a building that could be designated, but still kind of, following the criteria with it would allow them to make modifications. So why am I saying all of this? Um, I'm saying it because I think we definitely need to dig into those aspects of the demolition criteria. Um, I am interested in hearing what my fellow board members have to say about whether or not this building is in jeopardy of, um, you know, it being potentially you know, won't modified in ways that could no longer be landmarked, but still meet a criteria today. Um, and so I'm curious to hear what my colleagues have to say. Yeah. And, and I think the bulk of our discussion will be after Claire's presentation and public participation. And Claire, I don't know if you have more about this now, or if we're ready to see if there is someone representing the applicants. I have a, a presentation still. I can okay, take. Okay, that's what a I thought. Okay, look. thank you. <laughs> when don't we have a long? So this was our just our first round of initial questions. <laughs> yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm glad that Ronnie brought it up. Um, 
the criteria for review is um, for initiation is in 9113D. And the first items in 9113D refer back to 9111 and 9112 to outline the purposes and standards used to determine if the board has probable cause to believe that the building may be eligible for designation as an individual landmark. Um, in addition, 9113D directs the board to review the application based on whether there are currently resources available to complete outreach and analysis, and if there is community and neighborhood support, and if the building needs protections provided through the designation. Um, and also if the proposed designation is consistent with the goals and policies of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan, um, or if the proposed designation would generally be in the public interest. Um, and as the hearing is legislative, the board can consider any of the information heard so far um, or anything that they hear tonight. So uh, 568 14th Street, just to um, jog your memory, is located on the corner of Columbine and 14th Street in the um, Wellington Heights neighborhood, which is sandwiched between um, Chautauqua Park to the west and Floral Park to the east. Um, there are um, four designated historic districts nearby, including Chautauqua Park, Floral Park. There's also 16th Street, and um, University Place Historic Districts. Um, the neighborhood was included in the 2001-2002 University Hill resurvey, and um, that identified a potential expanded University Hill Historic District. And here's the map from that survey. At the time, 568 14th Street was considered contributing restorable. Um, this house to the north is 616 14th Street. This is an individual landmark. Um, this is the Died Rizal house. Um, there's also two houses across the street, uh, 535 14th Street and 515 14th Street. Um, they were identified at the time as being potentially contributing to the potential district. Um, both were designed by Glenn Huntington and built in 1941. Uh, so back to 568 14th Street, it's a um, modest one story concrete block um, and stucco building um, with a cross gable roof. Um, it was built in 1940. There are two street facing walls. Um, this is the front elevation facing onto 14th Street. And this is the, the north elevation facing onto Columbine. Um, the, uh, you can't see it's behind the tree. There's an original stucco chimney. Um, the double hung windows are um, wood. Uh, this is the, the back of the house, um, which is accessed from 15th Street Alley. Um, there's a one car basement garage, which you can see right here. Um, this, this shade structure was added sometime after 1950. Um, the, the south elevation is also um, has an addition from the from 1950. Um, it, it may have replaced an open porch, but we haven't found any photographic evidence of that or plans. Um, we just know that there is a visible connection um, where it was added. It's kind of here. You can see the line in the. You can't see it on this picture, but if you're there in person, you can see the line in the in the building where that was connected. Um, and at that time, they um, added these large picture windows. So the history of the building, uh, Ray and Lorraine Light bought the house in 1940 and lived there for three years. Um, the Currys purchased it from them and in 1943, lived there until 1948. Uh, both Roy Light and Vinton Curry were employed by the University of Colorado. Um, in 1948, Marsha Carpenter and her daughter Helen Carpenter purchased the house. Helen was um, born in 1900 and moved 
to Boulder in 1918 to attend the university. She graduated in 1922 and got a job in the College of Education Teachers Appointment Office. Um, during the, the Second World War, she, um, she grew the placement services program to connect university graduates with companies like IBM and Beach Aircraft. Um, she was made associate director of the program in 1952 and director in 1957. Um, she is one of the first female leaders within the university and um, someone who made business connections to expand opportunities for women graduates. She retired in 1968. Um, she actually served on the board of the Boulder Historical Society for almost a decade in her retirement. And she passed away on April 5th, 1995. She actually willed the house to the university and they sold it to the parents of the current, current owners. So the house uh, has historic integrity. Um, it has strong association with a historically significant person and the area has historic integrity. Um, so my interpretation is that um, this house would be eligible for individual landmark designation based on the criteria in 9-11-1 and 9-11-2. Um, however, probable cause, uh, which addresses whether the building could be designated is only one of the items the board should consider to identify if the building should be designated. Um, other items in 9-11-3 are whether there are staff resources for outreach and analysis. And as you know, staff resources are currently limited. Um, also, if there is community support, which has also been um, limited, although um, initiation is supported by Historic Boulder. We've received a few letters of support. Um, and important to today's hearing, whether the building needs the protections provided through designation um, as there is no current demolition application, the demolition approval would not be issued if the board takes no action to initiate designation today. The board is also asked to consider if initiation over the owner's objection represents a reasonable balance between private property rights and the public's interest and is consistent with the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. Um, the ability to designate over the owner's objection is um, an extraordinary power given to the landmarks board. And um, we always say that this should be used sparingly and with a lot of consideration. Uh, because there is no current demolition threat to the property, staff doesn't recommend, does not recommend initiation <laughs> over the owner's objection. Um, this is uh, based on the current demolition code, which Ronnie touched on, um, the, the owners can't remove more than 50% of the roof or more than 50% of the walls or remove any portion of either of the street facing walls without historic preservation demolition review. Um, modifications that can occur without historic preservation approval, um, staff doesn't consider would impact the historic integrity of the house. So uh, this summarizes the reasons for staff recommending the initiation outlined in the memo. Um, the house has architectural significance for its form and materiality. It was constructed more than 80 years ago and represents a pre-war post-depression development of the Wellington Heights area. Um, it has a strong association with a historically significant person and is located in an area with historic integrity. However, as the application um, to demolish the house was withdrawn by the applicant, we don't believe that the initiation would represent a reasonable balance between private property rights and the public interest. And um, in, because of that, we uh, change our recommendation to not initiate at this time. Any questions? John. I have a question. Did staff consider, I guess, the environmental criteria on this particular house? By that, I mean the, the context environment, 
the fact that it sits in the neighbor the Wellington neighborhood, it's kind of got an exemplary mature landscape around it, um, which one sees in that neighborhood quite a bit. And um, so it is, I guess, the entire site on the public realm side of the property, the two sides of the corner, benefit from this house, um, even in the state it is in, in terms of kind of its aesthetic presence. Yes. Was um, that considered? That's absolutely, yes. The context of this house within that um, intact area that's a potential historic district was definitely considered. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions? All right, Abby, I think we're um, ready to move on to public comment. Um, um, do, oh, do no, we hang on. Bill, Claire, or Brenda, if there's anyone here representing the applicants? I do not see anybody. Um, Whose name I recognize, but if uh, if you're here, maybe you could raise your hand if if it's somebody whose name I don't recognize. Not seeing anybody. Okay, then we will move on um, to public participation. Uh, Brenda, do you see anyone um, who is interested in speaking to this item? I do see one hand, and I encourage. Um, those of you in attendance from the community who would like to speak to this item to please use your raise hand button now. In the meantime, we will begin with Catherine Barth if Audrey is ready with the timer. Okay, thank you, Catherine. And you know, I'm going to ask you to, to swear to tell the whole truth again and state your full name and then you may proceed. And Catherine, you okay. should be able to I, I I would, make sure we have the timer ready for you. Okay, I, I would like, uh, I agree to tell the truth and nothing but the truth and the whole truth. Okay. <laughs> so please go ahead. Um, I, this was one of the properties um, that was on one day, I forget which day, uh, for the site visit. And I came out to the site visit, and um, the the young family was there with their toddler child. Their parents were there, and the young mom was very pregnant. And I think she's had a new baby since the site visit. Um, from what I got from listening, because I wasn't able to really say too much, was that they were. They, they appreciate this house. Uh, they like this house. The parents owned the house and the kids bought it from them. Um, and the parents uh, back at the alley were holding the hands of the little toddler and they, they did talk to me a little bit and they were saying that they, they were looking forward to their this daughter and family living in this house and their son will be living around the corner. And so it seemed to me that they, everybody there was very positive that they were, to me, what I observed is they were trying to get an idea of the parameters of what they would be able to do. And I heard them talk about putting an addition on the back. And of course the lot slopes down toward the east. And so, Putting an addition, an addition in the back um, is really pretty easy. I, I wished that Bonnie had been at that, at that site visit because I think in about two minutes, he could have talked to them about design opportunities because he was part of the Landmarks Board. So what I um, would like to see is that this family finds a wonderful way to make this into a family home and that the building is landmark. And I think that if somebody that, I would think the logical thing is for the family to come and support the support the landmarks board in the landmarking, 
because they talked um, and they understood, I think that there, that there would be the opportunity to have an ADU, they mentioned that. Um, they talked about the big trees and maybe where a playground, you know, place for kids would go. <clears throat> so I think that, you know, my, if I could talk to the family, I'd say, just go ahead and landmark it yourself. Um, I've lived in a landmarked house for years. I've been through the design review, both as an architect and part of the landmarks board and as a <clears throat> owner of the landmarks house. And I don't know why people think it's so scary because it isn't. And I don't think I've ever seen a project that doesn't come out better after the process of going through the DRC. So that's what I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, for getting that all in and your time allotted. Um, Brenda, do you see any other raised hands? I do not see any other raised hands. Oh, we do have one other raised hand that just came up uh, for Lynn Siegel. So Lynn, you should be able to unmute now and Aubrey will give you the time. I basically agree with Catherine. Um, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not opposed to demos. Um, in fact, I think after careful thoughtfulness about 3122.8, that should probably be demoed. But this house at 770 Circle, something happened. Because in all, you know, I'm no expert. I'm an ultrasound technologist. I'm good at imaging, but, but as far as architecture, but I have followed the Landmarks Board and the LDRC for years now. And my impression in watching over and over and seeing what guidelines there are um, is that something drastic fell through with regards to 770 Circle. Um, I mean, the Huntington, Jones and Hunter um, and the imagery <laughs> that was put up um, on, that I saw on the um, Carnegie site was stunning. You could really zoom in on it. And, um, and it was basically the same house. I mean, they put a front um, entryway onto it and some other things, but it was basically the same flagstone house. And it is an estate. When I first saw the image that was produced at LDRC, I thought that it was, you know, it was like a realtor imagery. Um, it was, um, I thought that it was concept designs for what the architect planned to do once they demolished it. But the image that I saw of the historic structure was very unimpressive, but it was poor imagery. It was just the wrong photos that got up there. Um, and when I went and I Googled it, I saw seven images and I sent those to you all and to Historic Boulder included them. I hope that Lynn Siegel and Patrick O'Rourke got it too. But in those images, you can really blow it up and see what it was before. Um, now on this site of this house that you're deliberating on now, um, it, I agree with Catherine. I think that it could be made better. I think a lot of times people in this town don't really know what benefit they can get from landmarking, but with you know funds from the state and stuff too. And that could be more publicized maybe. Um, but I do sincerely think something drastic happened with 770 Circle. And I just think that would be um, egregious to let it continue the way it has with, um, with this premature demolition or what I think is premature. I'd like to at least see people really be able to see the real thing. Um, thank you so much, Lynn. Your time has expired, but thank you. And Brenda, once again, has anyone else raised their hand? I am not seeing any hands raised and just want to take this opportunity to remind the community that public hearing comments are to be about the subject of the hearing um, not about other topics. So as the next one comes around, thank you for sticking to the subject of the hearing. Th thank you, Brenda, for that important reminder. 
So at this point, we'll um, close the public hearing. Um, there's no applicant to respond to anything that was said. And so I think we'll now turn it over to ourselves to deliberate. Um, Bill, I don't know if you would like to kick it off the conversation. Uh, sure, since you called on me. Um, I agree with Catherine that it'd be nice to landmark this property and allow this family to build onto it to make it the kind of home that they feel they can live in, uh, particularly because it's been in their family for so long. Um, and of course, we're right back to where we were talking about earlier on this property, um, where we talked about, should we continue forward with a uh, next step in the process of landmark designation if the applicant has withdrawn their demolition request. This applicant actually made it very clear in the very beginning that they were not really um, interested in demolishing the property. Um, they were interested in determining or, or feeling out, I think was the word they might have used or the phrase they might have used, as to just how far they could go with being able to modify it. So um, this one has got me a little um, um, kind of perplexed a bit. Um, I don't feel there's a threat um, to this particular property, even though they have withdrawn their application for demolition. Sometimes people do that, and I still think there's a threat because I think those people will come back. I don't believe that's the case with this particular applicant. Um, whether or not we want to continue forward with, you know, to the next step, 9-11-5, and toss this up in front of, uh, and then vote on it and potentially toss it up to council to let them take a look at it um, is, a, is a, different, um, a different situation. That's why I'm a little bit perplexed. To me, this, this landmarking this property would, would seem like it would be a, a, a sort of a nice, um, I don't know, gesture to the history of the people that lived here, to the family themselves, would kind of elevate the property a little bit, kind of raise it up and make it sort of a, a highlight maybe for the family. But they themselves are not asking to, to have it, at, you know, landmark. So um, that's kind of not really on the agenda for me anyway, in terms of a, a reason why I would go forward with this. Um, but anyway, if, if we were to uh, agree to just totally, um, uh, you know, let this stop at this point um, and allow the uh, situation that just kind of move along without a uh, threat of demolition, I'd be inclined to go that direction. Okay, thank you, Bill. And Chelsea, would you like to go next or wait till we hear from our two architects on the board? I'm ready to go. <laughs> Perfect, go for it. <laughs> thank you, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I I agree with Bill. I'm not interested in moving forward um, with landmarking this property at this time um, due to the fact that the applicants have um, withdrawn their their um, permits to demolish and and the fact that we did hear from them that they just weren't able to get the structural um, engineer in time and you know do all of the due diligence that is necessary to figure out what exactly even could be done in order to fix some of the structural issues and what the costs of that would be and so um you know it it just it wouldn't be fair to to the applicants to move forward in this process um without their support and without the information that you know they need and we need to truly understand what the implications of landmarking are and um so yeah so i i support um just letting the the or i guess i so well, i don't know what I'm, <laughs> exactly what i support <laughs> whatever the motion was i support the motion <laughs> um by staff to, to not move forward with initiation, knowing that, that there is no threat um, at this time and for the other reasons that I yeah. stated. <laughs> Thanks. So I, 
I believe that's taking no action, but I had to look taking it up. No action. <laughs> but yeah. I had to, it's I had to look that up, Chelsea. Okay, John. Uh, <laughs> um, all right. I uh, attended the site visit of this property and and met the people and um left feeling like they truly understood the value of this property and um pretty much understood its value as a as a presence in the public realm on the columbine and 14th side of the property um we discussed some of the issues um and some of the some of the i guess aspects of the 50 percent rule um and the i guess the the thing that i think i want to leave with again on this one is i think we want to acknowledge the historic value of this house and the fact that it could benefit from being designated the community could biz benefit from having this house designated um and i think we need to have a little more conversation with the owners about what the incentives to that process were because it would be totally my preference to go forward with this with them completely on board or even um initiated by them um and so I think we're kind of left in the position of the right move at this point is to take no action. Uh, thank you, John. Ronnie? Um, I uh, am in agreement with my colleagues. Um, I appreciate, Catherine, um, the comments that you made and I also think that you're right, that there is a solution, there's a design solution to this property that could probably get them the things that they need without, you know, detracting from the historic merit of this home. One version of that could even include landmarking it, you know, which I think we all understand what benefits might come from that. Um, but I'm in agreement with staff's assessment on this, which is, you know, um, to take no action. Um, if there's something that we can do to help clarify what the benefits are associated with landmark designation, uh, further explore a design solution um, that might be informative. Um, you know, I think while we're a little, if we move forward with staff's recommendation, there won't be like a codified process for that, but I think we could make room to have that talk somehow and, um, you know, hopefully come to some sort of conclusion that I think meets everybody's needs. Um, I was really poking at the beginning about um, the demolition criteria because, um, and I think that Claire's answer was really great um, because I do think that in this case, um this building is not under threat of desig of uh of demolition um in the ways that would significantly and detrimentally impact its landmark eligibility uh thank you ronnie and i'm so glad you're still with us in this meeting because your input is always so valuable so my first comments about this um having attended participated observed whatever for since 2006 in landmark board meetings. This is the first time I'm ever aware of three sort of um, consecutive stays of demolition that have been placed by the landmarks board, as well as discussions about initiating or not initiating and so forth, where all three applicants at some point have um, withdrawn their demo permit. And I'm not really sure what that says, but that is uh, what appears to be happening. And it's interesting to me because I know we felt strongly as a board on the 8th Street property and uh, maybe a couple of others to move as quickly as we could to try to get a resolution so that owners could move ahead with their planning or whatever they wanted to do with, with their homes or the properties they owned. And 
for some reason, for a couple of these um, specifically, uh, the applicant who withdrew on 14th Street and um, and on 8th Street, it seemed like um, we didn't have enough time to really continue ex exploring this. And again, the stay is triggered um, to expire at a certain time and or not last more than 150 days from when they pay the application fee. And I, I just wanna share very quickly that I know that Wellesley, Massachusetts um, has a year for their stay of demolitions or for the demolition process. And I feel like especially these owners on 14th Street and Catherine touched upon everything they were juggling at the time we had the site visit, I believe that was in June or July and um, came up to these dates where we had to make a decision or the stay was gonna expire and so forth. And, you know, having the luxury of getting an engineer out there and to get for us to have really thorough, comprehensive, accurate numbers to look on. It almost seemed in, in a couple of these cases that there wasn't enough time for everybody to do what they wanted to do to make a fully informed decision. And um, the, John captured a lot of what I heard from the owners at the site visit that you know, they weren't initially, I don't think they were so opposed to landmarking, but it was just something thrown at them that they really didn't have the time to contemplate and then the arrival of a new baby and so forth. And um, I, I did note that staff supported the initiation until the application was withdrawn. And I, I respect and understand why they changed um, made a different decision once that was pulled. And I also feel like it's funny because we always talk about preservation being reactive and well, there's no threat. And, and the one way to be proactive is to sometimes look at an individual property and say, this meets the guidelines, this meets the criteria. Um, this one is on a very prominent corner. And I know we heard from historic Boulder as well as a gentleman that lives in Floral Park and so forth. And then Catherine's verbal support tonight. But this is a little bit of a hard one because I don't think anyone ever takes landmarking over the owner's objection lightly. And I don't think we should, although I could cite numerous examples by starting that process many, many times before it got to even city council an applicant or an owner, you know, kind of came to understand the value and the, um, the, you know, wanted to move forward and supported landmarking, even though it started out sounding like it was totally over their objection. And, you know, Claire, thank you for these two motions tonight. And I think what I would have loved is sort of a middle ground where we had the ability to kind of table this and have another discussion with the owners. Um, I think there's a sense that, that you know, they may not have, um, they might still come to the same conclusion, but I think that they had to factor in a lot in a very short period of time with stuff going on. So this one is a hard one for me because it definitely meets the criteria. I think it was worth initiating and, and moving on to designation hearing. Um, but I also hear what my colleagues are saying. Uh, does anyone else have any additional comments? Is anyone um, wanting to entertain a motion? And, and that staff has provided us with two different motions. I would move. Um, do we have language, Claire, that you can display or should I just State Thank you. If you can just give me a sec, we'll share that. Okay. All right. I I move that the Landmarks Board not initiate the process for landmark designation as the property is not currently under threat of demolition. I'll second. There, Chelsea, thank you for it. So on a motion by John, Chelsea seconded. So we will do a roll call vote. Um, Bill? Aye. Chelsea? Aye. John? Aye. Ronnie? Aye. And I vote no. So the motion passes four to one. 
Okay. So we're now moving on and you guys, I wanna thank you all because uh, staff had kind of determined that we would be starting agenda item 5B, our next public hearing at 7.45 and we're only a few minutes uh, late on that. So thank you everyone for helping keeping this meeting online. So item 5B is a public hearing in consideration of a landmark alteration certificate application to install cementitious siding on a garage closure at night at a gar garbage enclosure, excuse me, at 900 Baseline Avenue in the Chautauqua Park Historic District pursuant to section 911.18 of the Boulder Revised Code 1981. The owner is the city of Boulder and the applicant is the Colorado Chautauqua Association. So we will move on to the second public hearing this evening. And um, thank you to Colorado Chautauqua Association who has agreed to this virtual meeting format. All right, thank you, Abby. Um, so I will go through the quasi-judicial hearing procedures. Um, everyone speaking to the item will be sworn in and board members will note any ex parte contacts. I'll give the staff presentation and after that the board may ask questions. The applicant may have 10 minutes to present to the board and the board may ask questions. We'll then open the public hearing. After all members of the public have made comments, the application, um, sorry, the applicant may respond to anything that was said. We'll then ask everyone to mute their computers and the board will deliberate. A motion requires an affirmative vote of at least three members to pass. Um, motions must state findings, conclusions and recommendation um, and a record of this hearing is kept by staff. Um, so before I pass it back to Abby for ex parte contacts, um, you all requested that we note who reviewed items previously at LDRC, and that was John and Abby on August 24th. Uh, thank you, Claire. Other than that meeting, I have no um, ex parte contacts. Bill? I have none. Chelsea? None. John? I have none. And Ronnie. Um, I had a meeting with Jeff Mednick and Shelley Benford um, in which we discussed their overall um, fire mitigation goals, um, which I do think is a topic that we need to um, talk about collectively. I'm sure some version of that will come up tonight. Um, at a certain point, we did touch on this very specific topic um, and how it overlaps with some of those objectives. Um, and, you know, of course, I made sure that I kept our conversation within any of the aspects of our current code that are, you know, demonstrated to the public. So there wasn't anything that was shared that had to do with the position or decision making. And I feel like I can participate in this conversation. All right, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Ronnie. All right, so um, as noted in the agenda, the criteria for review uh, are outlined in the Boulder Revised Code under 911.18b and 911.18c. Um, the criteria for review are to ensure the proposed work preserves, enhances, or restores, and does not damage or adversely affect exterior architectural features of the historic value or the historic value of the property, that the work is compatible with the character of the property, and that the Landmarks Board considers the economic feasibility of alternatives. The options today are for the Landmarks Board to approve the application. This is subject to a 14-day City Council call-up period. Um, the Board may also deny the application, which would be subject to a 45-day period in which City Council could review the decision. And a denial would mean that the applicant could not submit the same application within 12 months. Um, the Board may also allow the applicant to withdraw. 
So this application is related to an approved LAC from October last year. Um, the LDRC approved the construction of a trash enclosure, um, which was to be clad in lap wood siding. Um, and um, in August of this year, the applicant subsequently proposed the use of cementitious siding rather than wood. The application was reviewed by the LDRC on October 24th and referred to the Landmarks Board for review in a public hearing, um, which is why we are here today. So any questions from the board on process? Oh, okay, let's carry on. So the trash enclosure was constructed at the um, north end of the existing parking lot just east of the tennis court um, off of 12th Street in Chautauqua Park. Um, to orient you, this here is 12th Street, which is shown on the aerial here. Um, the tennis court is, is here, which is next to the enclosure also here. Um, this is the children's playground. Um, right next to it, which is here. Um, and this portion here, this is Sumac Drive and the Chautauqua Green. So the dining hall is here. Uh, this is the currently constructed frame of the garbage enclosure um, in, the, in this gravel parking lot. It's a steel frame. Um, this is this is the tennis court you can see right here. This is a close image of the structure and the tops of the trees behind. So this is the structure that is proposed to be clad in a cementitious siding um, rather than lapwood siding, which was originally proposed. So um, the siding is proposed to be lapped with a five and a half inch reveal um, and then painted Tudor brown, which is a uh, probably very familiar Chautauqua brown color to you. Um, and yeah, that's that's kind of it for the proposal. But um, anybody have any questions about that? All right. We'll move on to um, the design guideline analysis. Um, so in the Chautauqua Park Historic District Design Guidelines, um, we looked at the guideline for streetscapes, which says um, where modern materials and technologies are used, historic proportions and finishes should be matched or emulated. Um, the applicant is proposing the reveal of the siding to, that would emulate existing historic siding, which may be appropriate. Additional, additionally, the, um, the historic district guidelines include guidance that if matching materials is impossible, simplify. And since this is new construction, um, we considered it appropriate to take this simplified approach. The paint guidelines in the historic district request the use of paint color from the Chautauqua paint palette, and this is proposed with the Tudor Brown. In the general guidelines, uh, we looked at guideline 3.6 exterior materials uh, for wall siding and masonry, which says that um, new finished materials should be compatible with, but not seek to replicate original finished material. Um, use materials that are similar in scale, proportion, texture, and finish to those used historically. Use authentic materials, materials made to look like other materials, such as concrete that is scored to look like brick are not appropriate. Um, this one um, we've interpreted in many different ways, but uh, we considered that um, the use of cementitious siding would differentiate this new construction from historic buildings in the district. Um, and also that um, the cementitious siding is installed in a manner that is similar to wood lap siding in that it overlaps the piece below and the reveal generally matches historic siding. Um, from a distance, this does attempt to replicate application of traditional lap siding. However, um, as the garbage enclosure is not adjacent to any historic 
buildings for direct comparison um, and is in somewhat of a secluded location at the edge of the district. Um, this may be appropriate for this particular use. Um, we did consider the embossed siding with a formed wood pattern is um, not appropriate as a material made to look like other materials. So uh, guideline 6.4 materials um, seems to support this. The guideline asks for materials similar in, si in scale, proportion, texture, finish, and color to those found on nearby historic structures and to maintain a human scale by avoiding large featureless surfaces and by using traditionally sized building components and materials. Um, the proposed siding uh, using cementitious siding may be appropriate um, as the overall scale and the proportion of the siding and reveal generally match historic siding and the proposed color is consistent. So the analysis uh, led us to the recommendation that the proposal is generally consistent with the general design guidelines and section 91118B and 3 of the Boulder Revised Code. Um, the proposed use of cementitious siding on a garbage enclosure that's new construction doesn't remove or damage existing historic materials. It will have minimal visibility as it's at the edge of the historic district, so it will not impact the character or historic value of the district. And the proposal to use smooth siding um, with a similar reveal um, painted Tudor brown seems to be compatible with the character of the district and will emulate historic siding, but will not um, replicate or attempt to create a false indication that the garbage closure is a historic building. Um, the proposed work will not adversely affect the historic character of the district. And with that, um, we recommend that the Landmarks Board approve the Landmark Alteration Certificate request to install cementitious siding. Does anyone have any questions? All right. I believe um, so Jeff are we is ready here. to move on for the applicant's presentation? And Jeff, as you know, you will have 10 minutes. We will swear you in at the very beginning and you can introduce yourself when you're ready. I just need to get Jeff promoted over to panelist. He should be moving over right now. Thank you, Brenda. And Abby, don't forget to swear him in. Right, yeah. Jeff, when you're ready, I will need you to swear in, give your full name, and then your 10 minutes will begin. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. Great, thank you. Yes, my name is Jeff Mednick, and I'm the Director of Preservation and Sustainability at Colorado Chautauqua. Um, and I think that my presentation was pretty, pre I, mean, I think Claire did a terrific job and uh, sort of in the interest of time, I don't have a lot more to, I don't think there's a lot more to add other than, um, you know, we are, we think that the overall project and it was appro as, as approved is, uh, is a worthy project and we're continuing with. And uh, the cement board siding came up and I will um, honestly say as an afterthought due to the much conversation related to, a, to alternative materials in Boulder City and, and within the city and within the county. Um, so it's sort of a, uh, oh, I guess say devil's advocate to say continuing the conversation. Um, uh, that's, that's basically, uh, I think what we're here to discuss are the merits of the materials and not the enclosure itself. Is that it, Jeff? Um, uh, well, you know, I, unless there's some history required, we've gone through the process. This is, I've been on site for 15 years and this is part of our overall um, strategies for waste management. Uh, we've been um, dealing with that and uh, always have these goal, a goal to decrease our waste and to better manage the waste. And this, this has been something that's been thought about for quite a while. Um, uh, actually for many years as a way to consolidate 
that those efforts and also to the, um, the, the damage that's caused by the large trash trucks that come on site um, very, very frequently. They hit the buildings, they hit, they damage the roads. If you've been up there, you'll see that the roads are uh, in, in terrible condition. Uh, um, the, the, the streets and much of that damage is due to the heavy traffic that the, those streets were never designed for. Um, so this has all been uh, very, I believe, very well vetted in the thought process. And then again, we're here to discuss um, the use of which material. Wood siding has been approved for the structure. Um, if that's, if that's uh, um, well, I imagine we could move forward with that if we retract the application for the cement board, depending on our conversation. But I really don't want to... Um, you know, we've, we've discussed this several times. I don't want to bring it further than it has to as far as time spent. Uh, thank you, Jeff. And before I ask any board members if they have questions of you, will you swear retroactively that everything you just said was the full truth to the board? I absolutely swear. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions for Jeff before we uh, proceed to public participation? I have one. Jeff, could you just expand briefly on some of the reasons why you chose to switch from wood siding to the heart, the um, cementitious material? Um, John, I think, again, it was uh, uh, in somewhat a response of, um, of what we've seen uh, recently uh, related to the uh, wildfires. And as you, may, as you may know or not know, Chautauqua right now is, in, is very, very um, actively pursuing wildfire mitigation. And we've got several grants, state grants, National Park Service grant um, to, to continue that investigation. So we've always considered ourselves sort of a learning lab idea, this idea that let's, let's try something. Let's see if this, I mean, it's, it, again, it's sort of being a devil's advocate, I'd say. Um, in, in continuing a conversation that I think we're all as preservationists going to be uh, faced with. And uh, there's, there's no intention to use it further than on that one new structure. Um, but that is, it's in sort of, I guess, in the, uh, in the cause of conversation. And if, that, if that's, if that's a, a waste of our time, I apologize. No, thank you. That's, I just wanted to hear some of that reasoning. <clears throat> Any other question from board members for Jeff? Then we will proceed to public participation. And Brenda, do you see any hands <clears throat> raised yet? I do have one hand raised, um, and that is Georgia Chamberlain. As we are moving Georgia into position to speak, um, I encourage others to also raise their hands. Um, if they would like to be a part of this public hearing process. Um, I do have one person whose name is currently listed as MP, and I will need the whole name that you're commonly known by before you speak um, third on the list. So if you could put that in the Q&A box for me, I would appreciate that. In the meantime, we will start with Georgia Chamberlain. You should be able to unmute and Aubrey will put up the timer for you once you are ready. And I'm sure Abby will need to swear you in. I, I do need to swear you in Georgia and thank you for hanging in here with us during this meeting um, to speak at this time to this issue. So if you will swear to tell the board the whole truth and state your full name, your three minutes will then begin. Um, I swear to tell the whole truth this evening to the board and my name is Georgia Chamberlain. And I just wanted to say that I'm pleased that you're considering using this material and hopefully you will consider using uh, fire, fire retardant materials throughout the Chautauqua grounds. And that's all I, I'm here in support of using the new material. Well, Thank you so much for taking the time and effort to uh, share that with us. We appreciate it. Um, and Brenda, who is next in the queue? Yes, we have Miles Posen, who has moved up from third to second. Um, Patrick, also, I saw your hand pop up and down. OK, so Patrick, now you will be third. Uh, so we will move forward with Miles Posen. 
Okay, thank you, Miles, for being here. And again, if you will swear to tell the board the full truth and state your full name, then your three minutes will begin. Can you hear me? We can. Yes, we can. Okay, great. My name is Susan Turkel. I'm Miles Posen's partner. He couldn't be here this evening because he had a continuing education class planned way before this. But I have a letter that he has written, and I was just wondering if I could read that on his behalf. Yes, you may. Okay. Uh, to the attention of the Landmarks Board members, thank you for taking the time to review my comments and concerns below regarding the impending garbage enclosure being erected at 900 Baseline Road in the Chautauqua Historic District. In this communication, I will be referring to the aforementioned garbage enclosure as the centralized trash collection site for Chautauqua going forward, and it has been described to me in this way by various members of the Chautauqua staff. I have been a friendly neighbor of Chautauqua for the past 24 years. My home is located approximately 100 feet northeast of this new trash collection site. The structure sits on the north end of the east parking lot, which falls under the jurisdiction of Chautauqua's lease with the city of Boulder. Other nearby neighbors are less than 100 feet away from the trash collection site. I'm sending this letter in the hopes you hear my viewpoint as to why this is not an appropriate place to build a centralized trash location site, trash collection site, excuse me. First, it is important to note that in the spring of 1985, at the time plans for establishing the east parking lot were under consideration, the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board convened and reviewed the proposal to establish such lot at Chautauqua. Minutes from the 20, May 20th, 1985 Parks and Recreation Advisory Board meeting revealed a unanimous approval by the board that the east parking lot, this is a quote, I'm sorry, that the east parking lot to be strictly for overflow parking and not to be developed or asphalted and to be controlled and managed during appropriate functions with that intent, end quote. Subsequently, the August 26, 1985 meeting minutes from the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board meeting further revealed the landmark, Landmarks Board approval of such plan. Here we are decades later, and the east parking lot is in fact being developed and assaulted directly against the mandate approved by the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board and Landmarks Board. I am wondering as a resident who stands to be dramatically affected by this new trash collection site, just how Chautauqua was able to create a trash collection site, pour a cement slab, and build a metal framework on the east parking lot. Have there been any changes made to the mandate set forth by the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board? It's a question. If not, then the newly constructed framework and cement slab should not be allowable in the east parking lot. Secondly, before any further review and consideration of landmark alteration certificate applications, I believe there should be an intermediate immediate review of Chautauqua's plan for centralizing the trash collection, for, I'm sorry, for centralizing their trash through this new collection site. Furthermore, as affected residents, we would appreciate the opportunity to immediately receive and comment on any concepts, plans, and details going forward, which actually should have been done before any construction of the trash collection site commenced. If changes were made to the mandate, then I would encourage these to be shared with all affected residents and stakeholders for review. In recent years, two significant projects were completed, resulting in major improvements to the playground, tennis court, and lighting, both in and adjacent to the east parking lot. The planning of these projects involved all stakeholders, including Chautauqua Association, Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, Landmarks Board, City Council, Chautauqua residents, Chautauqua neighbors, and the general public. There were several review meetings held with all of the stakeholders where they were afforded the platform to provide feedback and input during both the concept and planning stages. A significant amount of time, money, and attention was dedicated to ensuring these projects were successful. And, and I ap apologize, I don't know how much longer the letter is, but your time has expired. Is there, are you just like a few words away from completing it? Sorry, I hit the mute button there, Abby. Um, Susan, if you want to unmute and answer Abby's question. Okay, I'm sorry. There was just a little bit more, just some bullets about why um, the trash, the considerations of, of why Miles is strongly opposed to establishing the trash collection site 100 feet from the homes. Okay, thank you. And I believe we also received um, an email from him as well, which was- Yes, you did, but I, I am I'm standing in for him and I had another commitment myself and I'm a little late and I apologize. I wanted to make sure that I at least yeah. could represent this um, communication. No, we really appreciate your time and joining us tonight to do that. Thank you. 
So I believe Patrick O'Rourke is next. Yes, we have Patrick O'Rourke. And if others would like to speak, now would be the time to um, raise your hand and let us know. Go ahead, Patrick. And please swear to tell us the whole truth, Patrick. Thank you. Patrick, I see you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Hmm. Maybe your microphone settings? Yeah, I still don't hear. Patrick. On Zoom, there's a little um, drop up arrow next to your mute button. And perhaps you need to um, select a different microphone option there. Although we heard you well earlier tonight. Oh, I see you frantically pushing your button, Patrick. Thank you for your efforts. Hmm. Let me um, disable your mute button and then try giving it to you again and see if that helps any. Uh, Oh. We, yep, I think we got you. Yeah, now I'm on. Um, I should call in. We can hear How's you. Patrick? Oh, Patrick Rourke, and I swear to tell the truth. It's Patrick Rourke, I swear to tell the truth. Thank you. So I, I had the opportunity to talk to Miles. I've, I've known Miles pretty much all my life. And he's a very um, easygoing person and a reasonable person. So I just thought I'd reach out to you and, and, and give you a couple comments. Um, I'm there every Sunday morning at seven o'clock. So I'm familiar with this site. I was there actually last week, kind of curious what that metal structure was doing in the middle of this parking lot, not knowing that it was gonna be a garbage collection site. Truth be known, the earlier LDRC review probably should have bought this forward. I'm not gonna put Ronnie or anybody else who reviewed it at that time. However, being in such a significant location adjacent to open land, that's the challenge I have with this. And having a garbage enclosure between the tennis courts and the open land and the view of downtown Boulder is just the wrong site. Literally speaking, I'm on Google Earth right now. It's 100, 100 feet away, 30 yards away from Miles' property. However, take it to the other side of the same parking lot. You're 210 feet away. You resolve a lot of issues. I'm familiar with garbage sites. I've done enough developments to know what they need are garbage trucks. And I would recommend that the the Chautauqua Association, and there's a perfect location where I park my car every Sunday morning to put this facility, and it's in the same location. So um, as being a good neighbor, I would hope that Chautauqua would, would do that. I also looked at the proposal, and the proposal that was submitted takes into consideration Chautauqua. It doesn't take into consideration the distance between this facility and the neighbors. If, in other words, if I was to ask you how far away there was from the auditorium, chances are it would be easily answered, but it wasn't, and I don't know if it was answered that it was only a hundred feet away from the neighbors. And knowing that there's gonna be a hundred houses worth of garbage put into my backyard, if I was Miles, I think I would be um, not encouraged and quite honestly would um, review the, the documents that might exist at an earlier time in order to make sure that Chautauqua works with them. And on that note, um, I'm hoping that Chautauqua might consider holding back on building at that location because it's not an expensive facility and just push it to someplace else that makes more sense. Um, and that's it, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Brenda, has anyone else raised their hand? Catherine Barth raised her hand briefly, and then it looked like she got um, Zoom kicked her out of the meeting. So I just want to check in, Catherine, if you would like. Yep, Catherine's hand came back up. So I am going to give Catherine her mute button, and Abby will swear you in. Yes, Catherine, once again, if you'd be kind enough to swear to tell the board the full truth. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You hear? Okay. I hope, I hope my swearing uh, still holds, but I will tell you the truth. Okay. Hello. Uh, hello. 
Yeah, we, we can, can hear you. Yeah, oh, you were okay. in and out at the beginning, but I think we got you now. Yeah, you sound clearer now. Okay, I have a couple of points. Okay, a couple of points. The site is a national, any um, advice and consent has been sought from the National Park Service or from the representatives in Denver uh, the National Park Service, and I think it should be. I think their their opinion on this design sh should be sought. And, and I also, um, having been up there a lot this summer and talking to the staff, they talk about all of the bears that are everywhere, and that it's something I'm wondering if trash should ever be kept. Like maybe trash has to be moved out every night. overnight there because there's when we were a lot of engagement with the community with the neighbors and that was an, an issue for the playground and for that parking lot that there were so many bears that the wait staff was afraid and in danger walking down to their parked cars so it doesn't seem like a good idea to be bringing more trash and bringing more attraction to bears when they are threatening the employees of, of the Chautauqua. So um, I think it's a bad place. I think, and, and the materials, this type of an enclosure, I think should have sought some review from the National Park Service considering this is a national historic landmark. This is an important site and a very important community here. And I don't know what has been done. I know during the lighting study that the neighbors were in the part We've started to lose you, Catherine. Uh, um, you were a little bit in and out uh, throughout, but we were able to through the, get your sentences and now we're but, losing you. And I don't know if they were invited to be part of this discussion about what I've been. You should have, you should have um, if you didn't, you should Catherine, should have, we're, we're just getting about every other word from you. And I imagine you're on a delay with us and maybe can't hear me, but. We're not able to hear full with sentences at the moment, neighbors. but I think we've we've understood where you were. We've understood your comments tonight. Do you agree, well, Abby? I agree. I think we got the gist of it. Okay, great. Thank you, Catherine. I don't even see Catherine's name in the meeting anymore, so I think she's she might have gotten no miss. Yes, not her friend right now. Yes, but but I, I think we did hear that she wondered what other entities were reached out to, like the National Park Service and so forth. So, um, Brenda, do you see any other members of the public who would like to speak to this agenda item? I do not see any. Oh, I see one more hand up. Um, Lynn Siegel would like to speak. Lynn, I will enable your mute button and then Abby will swear you in before your timer comes up. And, and Lynn, remember that this is only to speak to this particular public hearing on the trash enclosure at Chautauqua. And I do need you to once again swear that you will tell the board the full truth. I swear the truth. Yeah, um, these subjects cannot be distinguished from each other because it's a matter of trust. Um, and after 770 Circle, I have lost a lot of trust of the Landmarks Board and the LDRC. And it seems evident in this situation with the commentary that's come up that um, there's another issue here. And if I wanted to be strictly, um, like Brenda says, on the subject, I should say, hey, it's a no-brainer cementitious um, siding, of course. You know, it's fireproof. And like the house at 770 Circle is fireproof naturally itself 
already. Um, and that historic structures need to be, you know, preserved in the sense that 311 Mapleton is a fire hazard. There isn't any really other than city of Boulder fire restrictions. There isn't any requirement of such things. And yet that development is in direct proximity to where the big fire will come in and destroy the historic homes in Mapleton. So cementaceous siding would be great for that. But as far as the trust of the situation and the democracy going on here, I think it's very much failed um, in that the neighbors weren't um, consulted and that there wasn't a deeper dive given to the, um, the issue of wildlife and attraction and that the national park should have been consulted and the other various boards should have been consulted too. Um, and that's where, you know, you can't stick on just one subject because they're all interconnected. There's, you know, interdependencies of all these things. And um, so I'd say that this should really come back for a full review with all those other entities. Although I support Jeff, I love what Jeff's doing up at Chautauqua and I support the cementitious siding, of course, um, and for the reasons I described, but there's other elements going on here that are dis distracting from the fact that it's maybe not supposed to be in that particular site adjacent to the tennis courts. So yeah, there's problems here and there's problems, deep problems <coughs> with after this um, Huntington Hunter house is just demoed. So, so Lynn, if you would be kind enough to can just speak about 900 Baseline Road and the trash enclosure. Yeah, and 900 Baseline Road and the trash enclosure has uh, has a problem with me for the trust of the whole system here. That's what I'm talking about. And if that's not the subject, then mute me. You know, but that's the issue here: the process the democratic process that has failed again on this subject, at least in my view, and maybe someone could convince me otherwise, but it's not just a matter of cementitious siding or not. Okay, uh, and Lynn, um, unfortunately, your time has expired on this subject. And Brenda, any additional members of the public who wish to speak to this? I do not see any additional hands up at this time, Abby, so I think we may be safe to close the public hearing. Okay, we will officially close the public hearing for this agenda item, and Jeff, you are welcome to three minutes to respond to anything um, the public said. Okay, thank you very much, Abby. Um, and Jeff, uh, you may turn on your camera if you like. I know we said only audio testimony. That does not apply to applicants. Uh, that, that's okay. I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, again, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak again. And so many of the things that were mentioned, um, believe me, nothing, as, as you know, all know as well as I do, nothing happens quickly at Chautauqua. I mean, we had the approval to build this almost a year ago. And so by the time we, you know, but we do, we have a, a port of slab, we have built a structure based on the approval that we did go with. Um, as far as the, uh, you know, uh, trash and bears. So right now there are half a dozen enclosures uh, that are uh, sort of sporadic around the campus. So it doesn't, it doesn't, um, it, it's not like the problem doesn't already exist. Um, they're already what, who was exposed to problems or issues. I'm ac actually meeting with OSMP on Friday to discuss the bears and the couple of, there's a mother and a couple of cubs that are in trouble up there because they're just getting, you know, I mean, there's, there's just so much that goes on. So we thought that if we could control that to one area that we had more control over, we can make sure things are locked at night. I mean, it's just, people don't necessarily participate in that. I mean, this is just one part of what we were talking about is the, is the trash and, and the bears. You know, we don't wanna see bears get in trouble by any means. Um, the large gates that you might see on that structure um, what was never discussed is there's actually what I call a man door or a walk door, something like a garage, you know, a, a three foot wide door. So people don't have to open the large gates 
as frequently as the trash trucks will when they come up to, to empty the trash. So um, the conversations to date has really, I've really been with the state historic fund. We, we have worked very, very closely with the state. There's been a lot of changes as, as we all know. And um, we had a large grant from the auditorium. The state has a, a covenant on certain areas of Chautauqua, not that particular area, but we happen to have a lot of conversations with those folks. They came up to see the new cafe and, um, we discussed the, our efforts for, this is really, this is an effort towards sustainability, uh, you know, is how this really sort of started as far as waste management. Um, so, you know, I, I appreciate uh, everything that was said and I appreciate the, the folks that are in support of it. Um, but I also, I, under, I understand concerns and I think that Chautauqua tries to do as good a job as we can um, addressing as many <laughs> participants as there are at Chautauqua. There's a lot of players, there's a lot of stakeholders and it's, it's just important to keep them involved but, um, and it, but it's hard to, to make sure everybody is on board. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay, Jeff, thank you for these comments. And now we are going to uh, return it, this issue to the board for um, board deliberations and um, you know, Bill, we've been uh, kicking it off alphabetically in this virtual format. Um, when, when we were meeting in person, we could kind of uh, raise a hand easier, kind of uh, use body language to say we'd like to go first. But if you'd be willing to kick off this discussion, that would be great. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry that um, the applicant, um, I'm sorry, the um, the neighbor who is voicing his concerns about the location of this uh, this structure um, can't be given a fair hearing tonight because we're not here to discuss that. We're here to discuss the use of a non-natural material um, on a structure that is within a National Historic Landmark uh, and which was previously approved to have natural material applied to it. I personally don't have a problem with um, that kind of siding uh, on a new structure like this, um, even if it is, you know, in a national historic landmark. Um, I live in a historic district and my garage does not have original cedar siding on it as it was a new structure built in the 1990s or maybe early 2000s before I bought the property. Um, so it doesn't have natural siding on it. I, I understand when we put new structures in that there is a there's a um, a different standard at least apparently, um, judging from the way my my home was built uh, or my garage was built. But anyway, I don't have a problem with this particular uh, application. Um, I do want to point out though that um, there was a letter that came in that I read. Uh, maybe from maybe possibly one of the people that spoke uh, on this topic, uh, wishing to expand this discussion to allow all structures up in Chautauqua to have um, fire retardant siding applied to them. And I want to point out again, this is yet another reason why we have to address this topic now. Because once we approve something like this, we will continue to get more requests and more requests. And right now, by allowing this to happen, um, we are, as staff so clearly pointed out, per section 3.6, um, the use of authentic materials is encouraged and the use of non-authentic materials discouraged. We are making an exception to that guideline. I've, I've laid out my reasons why I agree with that exception, but, I, but I'm worried, concerned that this continues to be it a topic that is not being addressed by either the historic preservation staff or by this board. And we will get more and more of these things coming up and that will continue to um, put the landmarks board in a, in a uh, I think, difficult position. But I'm in favor of, of applying this particular uh, type of siding to this particular structure. Okay, thank you, Bill. And thank you for also um, bringing up the, the letter from the neighbor and so forth. And I hope every Landmarks board member got to, had a chance to read the email from KJ that he sent this afternoon before the meeting, sort of addressing those issues that go back to um, 1985, but 
that's not what's before us tonight. It is this, this LAC for this trash enclosure with the cemetitious siding. Um, so I just wanted to, to call that out. Um, uh, Chelsea? Uh, Abby, actually it wasn't, although I read his, it was not his, it was a, a, a lady. A woman. Oh well, no, and I know yes, and I think she did speak this evening. I think we got we got KJ's clarification for yeah. Miles' letter, and then I think there was um, an interest or you know a request to this be considered throughout the um, entire historic district. But right now we're just looking at this one item, uh, Chelsea. Yeah, I am in favor of allowing um, this request and for the reasons that staff laid out um, and for, you know, just the logical reasons of its new construction, it's better to have materials that are more resistant to fire. And I think for the longevity of the enclosure, um, it makes sense. I also, I just, I do want to point out for the neighbor who um, who spoke out with his concerns and for the person who spoke, um, for him, I, I do want to share that, you know, I live in, um, an area where we have a shared, a shared garbage facility that is about the same size as this. And our, you know, our house is only, you know, 60 feet away from it. And it, causes no problems, there's no smells, there's no noise, it's not an issue. So um, while I appreciate the concern um, as somebody who lives in a situation where we have this type of enclosure, it, it truly is not a problem. Um, so hopefully that provides some comfort, <laughs> but that's it. Thank you so much, uh, John. So, um... In the case of this particular review, um, I'm in favor of the material being used here because it's new construction and um, because it's being used in a way that is at least sensitive to the district and colored in a way that fits into the district. In fact, it's a selection from the palette in the district. Um, I think that I agree with Bill that I think that we have to have, particularly about this material, I think we have to have a much more robust discussion about it, especially when used on structures other than new construction. It's, it's an arguably resilient material, um, so that is somewhat more sustainable in some respects than other materials. It's also arguable that it offers a certain amount of fire resistance. Um, in the case of this structure, since it's the principal material, it actually would offer a certain amount of fire protection. Although it's just resistant to fire, it's not going to necessarily completely negate the damage that fire would do, particularly if it's a particularly hot fire. It's not asbestos and it doesn't have the same resistive qualities as asbestos. On other structures, or when added to other structures, um, it is not going to be a magic solution to the issue of wildfire. There's so many factors that make a structure subject to fire damage and that make it subject to being engulfed by fire that just adding one material to one portion of the building is not going to do that trick. So I think it's a, it's a discussion that we have to have for a lot of reasons. We do need to be making choices of materials that offer more, more resilience and that are more sustainable materials. But what is truly appropriate in a historic district and what isn't is something that we need to explore a little more deeply with this new class of, of materials. But I support this particular application. Thank you, John. Ronnie? Yep, um, I don't have much to add. I agree with my colleagues here and staff's report. You know, I do think that for the time being, our 
kind of policy around the, um, you know, material is kind of a case by case decision. And I think the way that staff wrote this up um, presented that very well. Um, and, you know, I don't feel like I have to recap them all, um, but perimeter condition, new construction are two that I think resonate the most. All of the other aspects of <clears throat> the design that are the qualitative pieces that make it compatible, I think we're also described well in staff's report. So, you know, I applaud um, the association for exploring this. You know, I think Jeff was saying um, that they're a laboratory of sorts and, you know, these aren't easy decisions. I think there will be versions of this that might be harder for us collectively to come to consensus on. Um, but I do think that this particular one, um, you know, pilots a pretty good question in a place that's sensitive. Um, lastly, I believe that um, if we go forward with an approval like this, it does not diminish um, either the character or the status um, of this landmark area. Um, and it doesn't put in jeopardy the, current, the, the landmark status of the campus. So, you know, if those flags started to be raised, um, I think we might have a more challenging conversation on our hands, but I don't think that's the case for this. Um, and I plan to support the request. So, so thank you, Ronnie. And, um, you know, this is a, is a difficult one because I think it's, it, I just feel like the, the card is going before the horse and it just really points out how desperately I need education about this material, as well as updates to not only guidelines that we all um, refer to, but what um, the Secretary of Interior guidelines um, from the National Park Service because, you know, where I'm really struggling, this is a, a National Historic Landmark and um, this is with the, the Secretary of State of Standards still not having this um, something that they, they support at this time. And I think one of the biggest board priorities when we talk about board initiatives a little later under matters is that I would, I would, I crave a training, an expert, 30, 45 minutes of someone really explaining to me about this material. I've also heard that it's not the most recyclable material. When it's used on a house, I understand that it doesn't provide, you need to provide more insulation in that house because this in and itself doesn't provide the same um, insulation that other other sightings do and I think that I applaud all the efforts of Jeff the CCA and you know it is a learning lab it is a a real life um, opportunity to explore this but you know where I'm struggling is I don't have a guideline or I have staff expertise I have what the board is bringing to this decision but I don't have something like the National Park Service or Secretary of Inter Interior Standards or our guidelines haven't been updated to um, I don't have that hook to hang my vote on so I won't be supporting it even though I think this will be if, if this if this proceeds as it sounds like it's going to it it will be a real learning thing to me but what I'd love to see and I'm hoping either an upcoming session at either the CPI conference in Boulder in February or the National Trust for Historic Preservation conference in in November I realize how inadequately I have been trained or have the knowledge or can find the information to make a well informed decision for for the appropriate and the use of this in, in our resources, I, I think it comes to, I'm totally open to exploring the validity of technology and it's just, you know, making leaps and bounds in, in progress, but, but I don't have that hook to hang my vote on other than a, a leap of faith. And so I won't be supporting it, but I, I think I'll be very curious to see if, if this does go through, you know, what, what we learn from that. Um, is there any other discussion or would someone like to make a motion? I can make a motion, um, Claire, if you can pull up the recommended motion. Okay. 
I move that the Landmarks Board adopt the staff memorandum dated October 12th, 2022 as the findings of the board and approve a landmark alteration certificate to install cementitious siding on a garbage enclosure at 900 Baseline Ave. In the Chautauqua Park Historic District as shown on application received August 16th, 2022, finding that the proposal meets the standards of issuance of a landmark alteration certificate in Chapter 91118 BRC 1981 and is generally consistent with the general design guidelines. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, uh, on a motion by Ronnie, seconded by John, we'll take a roll call vote, Bill. Uh, Bill, are you on mute? Yes, I am. And I was suggesting that we ask for one last uh, period of discussion to discuss the motion, if anybody has any. Oh, okay. Does anyone have anything they'd like to comment on now that a motion is on the table? No. Okay, I'll vote yay. Chelsea. Yes. John. Aye. Ronnie. Aye. And, and I vote no, so the motion passes four to one. Um, thank you, Jeff, and thank you to everyone um, from the public who spoke to this. And I'm, not, I'm sorry, I, I would just like to thank you folks um, for the consideration. And I think in that respect that Chautauqua was, was some sec, somewhat successful in, uh, in making us talk about, it. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, you know, again, I know we have plenty to talk about. So I, 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 I appreciate your time. I appreciate the issue being kind of forced on that. I just wish we could have had a, you know, I would have liked some training or, or thorough information from, from someone prior to having to vote on this, but thank you, Jeff, for everything you do. Um, I was going to propose that we take a five minute break. Is everyone okay with, oh, Ronnie? Um, I support the break, but... Um... <laughs> I think it's my I think it's my turn to sign off and recover. Okay. Um, I apologize to everybody, but I think I'm gonna split. I may have heard this. I'm feeling under the weather, and I think it's my time to go crash. So Feel better. A good yeah. idea, Ronnie. Ronnie, we so appreciate well. you being with us this long. You've been, it's been very valuable to have your participation and we still have a quorum to proceed. So I'm going to suggest that we reconvene at, at 8.50, I almost said 9.50, oh my God, at 8.50 p.m., okay, everyone? Yes. Okay, thank you.
So um, I believe everybody's back. I see John and Chelsea and Bill. Okay, I'm just gonna wait to make sure John is back. Thank you, everyone. Okay, John has returned, so um, we will get started with our last public hearing of the evening. This is a public hearing in consideration of a landmark alteration certificate application for a uh, array mounted on the street facing roof at 875 14th Street, a non-contributing building in the University Place Historic District. Um, pursuant to section 91118 of the Boulder Revised Code 1981. And um, the owner is Kevin Baum and the applicant is Namaste Solar. And thank you in advance to the owners and the applicant who have agreed to this um, virtual format prior to the meeting. So Claire, I believe you're going to kick us off, but we should probably, um, impart any ex parte contacts. And I, I think you have listed who has seen this already at LDRC, correct? Yes. Um, well, for the benefit of the applicant and the owner, um, I'll just quickly go through what's involved in the quasi judicial hearing process. Um, everybody speaking today will be sworn in and board members will note any ex parte contacts as Abby mentioned. Um, I'll give the staff presentation after that the board may ask questions. Um, the applicant will have 10 minutes to present to the board and the board may ask questions of the applicant we will then open the um, public hearing. After all members of the public have made comments, the applicant may respond to anything that was said. We'll then ask everyone to mute their computers and the board will deliberate. Um, a motion requires an affirmative vote of at least three members to pass. Motions must state findings, conclusions and recommendation. Um, and uh, a record of this hearing is kept by staff. So um, previously reviewed at the LDRC, that was Ronnie and Abby on August 10th. Right, back to you, Abby. Thank you. So I have no ex parte contacts other than that meeting. Uh, Bill? I have none. Chelsea? None. And John? None. Okay, thank you. All right. So um, the criteria for review are outlined in the Boulder Revised Code under 9.11.18. And the criteria are to ensure the proposed work preserves, enhance, or restores, and does not damage or adversely affect exterior architectural features of the historic value of the property or the historic value of the property. Um, that the work is compatible with the character of the property and that the Landmarks Board considers the economic feasibility of alternatives. The options today are for the Landmarks Board to approve the application. This is subject to a 14 day City Council call up period. Um, they may also deny the application, which would be subject to a 45 day period in which City Council could review the decision. Um, a denial would mean the applicant could not submit the same application within 12 months, um, but the board may also allow the applicant to withdraw. So this application was received on July 29th and, um, like I said, reviewed by the LDRC on August 10th. Um, the LDRC referred the application to the Landmarks Board for a review in a public hearing, which is why we're here today. So any questions from the board on process? We're well practiced now because we just did this. All right. Okay, so. Um, 875 14th Street is located on the west side of 14th Street. This is 14th, uh, between Cascade and Aurora. Um, the black outline on this map is the University Place Historic District. 
and 875 14th Street is a non-contributing property within the district. It's outlined in yellow right here. Um, the house was constructed in 1957, which is outside of the 1890 to 1941 period of significance for the district. Um, this is the photograph from the 1958 tax assessor card. Um, and on the, on the right here is a 1948 photograph of a lovely car that's been in an unfortunate accident. But fortunately for us, in the background, we can see um, uh, 875 14th Street is not there. Um, it would be right here. It will be built right here a few years later, actually a decade later. So this is a very minimal traditional house with a simple gable roof um, and windows placed tightly under the eaves. Um, it was heavily modified in 2011. Um, the, the under the house garage was incorporated into the living space and two dormers were added uh, to the front of the house. Um, you can see on the site plan from, from back then um, in 2011, there's a large dormer added here and a smaller dormer here. Um, and a new front porch was added. That's what you can see here. Um, and that would be over this entire front portion of the house. So these are current photographs of the house. You can see the, uh, the front porch added, a little shed roof here with uh, porch columns underneath. And um, this is the large dormer. Um, and you can see the, the smaller one just hiding out right here. Um, the trees kind of got in the way of these pictures, but again, this is the porch roof with the large dormer on top. And if you can imagine the, the original roof line is this kind of hiding behind the tree here. So the proposed scope is to install 15 black on black solar panels on the surface of the large dormer facing 14th Street. This is 14th Street right here. Actually, this is the sidewalk. 14th Street is here. Um, the, uh, this is the, the porch shed roof here and the smaller dormer on the roof here um, and this entire area is the large front facing dormer. You can see my pointer, yes. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so the uh, according to the applicant, this array would produce a approximately 7,316 kilowatt hours per year, which is 92% offset of the energy needs of the homeowner. Here's a photo simulation from a, a bird's eye perspective. Um, again, this is the porch roof down here um, and the dormer roof with the, the panels on top. So on the left here, um, the applicant provided an illustration indicating the location of the panels up on the dormer roof here. Um, on the right, this is a, a photograph um, that I took standing on the top step of the church opposite the house. Um, and you get a better, more of a clear view of the, uh, the front facade. Um, and this is the roof here proposed for the, the panels on top. So the applicant also provided a, a LIDAR model showing the proposed location of the panels. Um, the brighter yellow on the model is the more sunlight. Um, so the brighter the yellow, the more the sunlight. Um, I, the applicant probably can explain this better than me, but the darker the colors, the worse it is for solar panels. Um, their analysis is included in the memo. They did provide an analysis of adding panels to the rear. Um, of the roof, which is the west elevation. Um, and the, the analysis that they provided um, said that they could install 16 panels in total on the rear roof, but that would produce um, only 
5,652 kilowatt hours per year, which is a 71% offset of the energy needs of the homeowner. So that's a, a difference of um, 1,664 kilowatt hours per year. So um, actually, before I move on, did anyone have any questions, preferably non-technical ones about solar panels? Bill, I see you Claire, talking. You, Claire, yeah. this is Bill. I'm sorry, I didn't get my hand up. But do you have an, any other photographs of this property from the street other than the one you showed us? Uh, there's this one, and um, these are from the sidewalk. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Did anybody else have a question? All right. We'll move on. So um, the university place guidelines refer to the general design guidelines for non-historic structures, which this is. So in the general guidelines, um, we looked at guideline 3.1, roofs, skylights, and solar panels, uh, which generally says to preserve the roof form, slope, and height. Um, the solar panels should not compromise the historic integrity of the building, and they should not be highly visible, particularly from the front of the house. The guidance is to place them on rear-facing roofs or on the ground. Um, we considered that flush mount panels wouldn't significantly affect the slope height or um, form of the roof. And um, we also expected that pedestrians um, wouldn't be able to see them. They wouldn't be highly visible, um, someone very tall or in a tall, ve uh, tall, tall ve vehicle may be able to see them. Um, but uh, we didn't think that this would compromise the historic integrity of the district. We also looked at guideline uh, 4.1, protection of historic buildings. Um, and um, not so much for the protection of the non-contributing building, but for the district overall. And the guideline says that character defining features should not be destroyed, damaged, or obscured, and new additions should be constructed so that they may be removed in the future without damaging the historic structure and that the proposal should not detract from the overall historic character of the district. Um, and we considered that no historic features would be damaged or obscured by the panels, that the panels could be removed in the future without impairment to the essential form and integrity of the property. We also looked at guideline 4.4, compatibility with historic site and setting. Um, it also seemed important uh, as this is a historic district. Um, it says that uh, to design new additions so that the overall character of the site, site topography, character defining site features and trees are retained, um, locate new additions um, on an inconspicuous elevation of a historic building, generally the real one, and locating an addition to the front of the structure is inappropriate because it obscures the historic facade of a building. And we considered that the panels would be in an inconspicuous location and wouldn't obscure any historic features. So the analysis led us uh, to the recommendation that the proposal is generally consistent with the general design guidelines and section 911.18 of the Boulder Revised Code, and that the installation of 16, uh, sorry, six kilowatt photovoltaic system on the street facing roof of a non-contributing building will have zero to minimal visibility and will not damage the character of the immediate streetscape nor adversely affect the special historic character of the University Place Historic District. Um, the house is considered non-contributing to the district being constructed outside of the period of significance. In addition, um, an alternative location has been studied and proven non-viable and the array can be removed in the future without impairment to the essential form and integrity of the historic property. And the proposed work will not adversely affect the historic character of the district. So with that, here is the recommended motion. Um, 
which we recommend to adopt the staff memo and issue uh, an landmark alteration certificate. Any questions? All right. So Claire, it appears it's time for the applicant's presentation. It is, and I believe they are uh, here. Yep, Ben is um, representing the um, <coughs> Namaste Solar. So um, Aubrey or uh, Brenda, if you would. Oh, you did it already. You a step ahead of me. And Ben probably knows he has 10 minutes for our presentation. Um, and Ben, when you are ready to speak, we do need you to swear to tell the board the full truth and state your full name. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Long. Uh, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and all that good stuff. Um, I don't think I'll need the full 10 minutes. I think uh, we did sort of go through the, the highlights. Claire did a great job of summarizing that for us. Um, yeah. If, just sort of to, to touch on the high level things. Um, we did do like to do the black on black panels to be as, you know, less visible as possible. Um, we did also explore putting it on the array on that back roof. Um, there for, for a few reasons, um, we, uh, we decided to go with the front. Uh, not only is there more sun out there, less shade, uh, there's also uh, fewer skylights back there, which can be a, uh, a hazard when installing. And also just for some other technical reasons, the uh, it's just more efficient due to the light that we get in the morning on that east side. And uh, as opposed to what we get in the west, just due to heat and a few other things. Um, my colleague Noah, project manager for this uh, installation has also joined us on the meeting um, and he'd be able to speak to some of the more technical aspects if you have questions to that. Um, and yeah, he actually would like to speak uh, as well. So uh, feel free to mute me. And if you can unmute uh, Noah, I'm sure he, he has plenty to contribute. Uh, welcome Noah, uh, we will need to swear you in as well. And he should have control over his camera and mute button now. Hi there, sorry, it rejoined me. Um, my name is Noah Harried. I'm a project manager with, with Dominus Hay Solar, Solar, as Ben mentioned. Um, the the homeowner, uh, Kevin Baum, um, wanted to join us tonight, but unfortunately he is out of the country uh, for business um, and it's about two in the morning where he is uh, right now. So he, he opted not to attend. Um, I wanted to, to thank the staff for uh, presenting the, the information that we provided. Um, we did do uh, extensive studies looking at, at the viability of, of adding the array on uh, the west facing slope of, of the house, as uh, Ben mentioned. Um, we, when we, there, yep, there's that other, uh, that other model. We could see what, what we could fit up there uh, and due to the additional trees um, and the, uh, the afternoon sunlight, um, cuts off more with the effect of the horizon as we get closer to the mountains, uh, in addition to the added temperature late in the day, uh, are all factors that contribute to the lower production. Um, and it's, you know, not, not a viable option for, for uh, Mr. Baum and his family um, due to the added cost of, of the solar. Um, and uh, in, in Doing a review, uh, we also wanted to point out there was a another contri non-contributing structure uh, in this district within the past year that was uh, granted a certificate by this um, committee at 1333 Cascade, um, and uh, we, we did go by and, and submit some photos as well. Um, so uh, there is some some precedent, and uh, happy to to answer questions for folks um, about the impact of, of the array on this part of the roof. Um, and uh, thanks again for showing, showing the, the data that we, we gave to you. And Noah, belatedly, will you just raise your hand and say everything you just spoke to was the full truth to the board? Oh, yes, I 
that, it was all the truth. Thank, thank you. I'm sorry, but it's it's a formality. I want to of course. make sure to to take care of. Um, so, do any board members have any questions for Noah or Ben? I I'm not seeing any. Um, Bill has his hand up. Abby. Oh, Bill! Oh, Bill! I'm so sorry. I see it. Go ahead, Bill, please. I think I'll just set, shut my video off from now on. I don't think it's doing anybody any good. Um, Noah, you mentioned a precedent on Cascade Street. Uh, two things. Is this precedent you're referring to in, a, in another historic district? And second thing is, is it on a street facing um, uh, surface? Uh, the, the home I'm referring to is 1333 Cascade. Uh, it is on the same block in the same district, uh, and there are panels facing the street side uh, at, a, at a higher angle uh, than the current property. 1330 Cascade, thanks. Uh, 1333. 1333, okay. That's all I have. <laughs> okay, thanks, Bill. John? Um, just, Noah, can you clarify um, the meaning of higher angle? Do you mean that it's more visible? For, is, it, is it steeper to the street view? or flatter. That's correct. Higher, by higher angle, I mean uh, a steeper pitch. Um, right. Okay. Than, so yes, it is more visible than uh, the current proposal. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions from board members before we move on to public participation? So, so, Brenda, do you see any hands raised at this point to speak to this issue? I do have two hands up at this point. We have Catherine Barth and Lynn Siegel. So we'll start with Catherine. Catherine, I'll unmute you so Abby can swear you in, and then your timer will start. Hopefully we will be able to hear you better this time, yeah. Catherine. And and Catherine, I, I believe this will be the last time you need to be sworn in this I evening. I know, I'm getting tired. <laughs> it's time to go to bed. <laughs> but anyway, um, um, as I remember, in the historic districts, there is always a concern, um, and this is a non-contributing building, but that, uh, that work that's done on a non-contributing building does not negatively affect the historic district. And <clears throat> this particular uh, situation with that large dormer roof um, and the photographs that were taken from the sidewalk and from across the street convinced me that putting skylights on the front of this house, which normally is, is you don't put them on the front of a house, is acceptable in this case. And I do not think that there is a, a very negative effect on the district from this. And it seems I'm convinced from the maps of the amount of solar that hits this roof as opposed to the roof in the back, that this is a better location from the, the way the solar panels will work and the technology. So, even though it's solar panels on the front of a house, I would, I think I would cautiously advise the board to go ahead and approve it. Thank you, Catherine. And Lynn, I will go ahead and unmute you so you can also be sworn in for the last time this evening and yeah. then the timer will start. I thought the skylight was sworn in, sworn to truth. Um, I thought the skylights were on the back part of the house. Um, maybe I misunderstood. And that's why they didn't, one of the reasons that the owner said he didn't, or someone said they didn't want to place the, have to juggle around skylights just on the side. But um, yeah, I support this. Um, it's, it's pretty much of a no brainer, but 
then I met Jeff Medanich at Boulder Green Builder Guild 30 years ago. So I've been interested mostly in, you know, sustainability for a long time. Um, and um, yeah, I don't think it significantly, uh, I mean, theoretically, listening to all the guidelines, it does not meet um, everything that it should, you know, that it does affect the visual field. But I think that, that, that it's worth the benefit in the energy savings and the, bene the long-term benefit to the whole historic community financially of having solar implemented into the whole system of how we live culturally. I think it provides more economic benefit to the historic community through the savings it, that, that are exhibited from using solar. So no brainer, yes. Done. Thank you, Thank you Lynn. And Brenda, do you see anyone else who would like to address this agenda item? I do not see any other hands up at this time. I think we are um, able to close public comment. Okay, so public participation is officially closed for this item. And Noah and Ben, you, you are entitled to three minutes um, to rebut or to add any additional comments after public participation. Uh, I think I'd just like to, to thank uh, members of the public for uh, sharing their views on this. And, um, you know, we, we agree, we think, more solar is better for our community um, as we try and meet some some lofty climate goals. And uh, we, we appreciate the time that the board and the staff has taken in reviewing this um, and, and working with us to help provide all the information that, that was needed to, to make a uh, informed decision. So thank you all uh, for letting us make our case. Thank, thank you gentlemen so much. So I believe this is time to move it back to board discussion. Um, Bill, are you willing to kick it off? Yeah, I have nothing to discuss. I'm ready to vote. Thank you. Uh, Chelsea. I too am ready to vote. <laughs> <laughs> okay, John. Yes, also ready to vote. Okay, so, and I am also ready to vote. Would someone like to make a motion? And Claire, yeah, if you I'll could pull motion, that up yeah. on the screen. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Move the Landmarks Board adopt a staff memorandum dated October 12, 2022 as the findings of the board and approve a landmark alteration certificate for a six kilowatt photovoltaic array mounted on the street facing roof at 875 14th Street is shown on plans dated August 10th, 2022, finding the proposal meets the standards for issuance of a landmark alteration certificate in chapter 91118 BRC 1981 and is generally consistent with the general design guidelines in the University Place District Design Guidelines. Thank you, Bill. Is there a second? I will second. Thank you, John. So on a motion by Bill, seconded by John, we'll take a roll call vote. Uh, no, no, we want to have oh, a little discussion. We want to have discussion. I'm sorry, Bill. Thank you. Yeah, um, we always have to have discussions after we approve these things. Um, I just want to, you know, put in my point that this is not consistent with the design guidelines. However, it is consistent with what with what we understand to be the the sort of intent of the guidelines as they interact with Boulder's uh, larger um, initiatives. Um, and this is one of those situations where it's good to have a human being um, look at the guideline, look at the actual condition that we're faced with, and then make a judgment call and say, well, we really can't see these panels from the street. We can barely see them from across the street. Why would we have these guidelines in place? Well, because most most roofs facing the street don't have such a 
uh, gentle or a uh, lack of uh, degree, angular degree facing the street. So it's kind of good to have a guideline that kind of sets it, but we're here in a, at a situation where we can make exception to it. And I think this is a great example of why we would make an exception. Um, I agree, Bill, and after having been one of the members of the LDRC on August 10th, um, I know we kind of put Namaste through the hoops and asked them to really explore the West Side and then coming back with, um, you know, thank you for doing that and showing kind of what the loss would be by placing them on the rear of the house. And, and I think Bill hit the nail on the head with the pitch of the roof. And, um, you know, it's, it's always curious to me when people think they have to choose either historic preservation or um, energy efficiency when they both can go beautifully hand in hand. And I think this is one of the projects that demonstrates that. Uh, John and Chelsea, any comments? Um, I just have one brief comment that we have since, since at least I've been on the board because the, the guidelines don't fully discuss the issue of, of photo or solar voltaics on roofs we did at one point in our ldrc reviews and and subsequently come up with criteria criteria that we um, apply to these reviews and the criteria um have been fairly well met in this case, the criteria being we first look at position on the roof or location on the roof. The ideal is to keep them off of the front of the roof, but that failing that, which we did by analysis, um, locating them on a part of the roof with the least um, visibility. We also, the second criteria is orientation on the, or, position relative to the roof slope. In other words, that they be mounted flat to the roof is preferable. And then the third criteria was color, that they either match the roof material directly or that they be as dark as possible to be as unapparent as possible. So this meets all of them. And so it's allowable. <clears throat> Thank you, John. Anything to add, anybody? Then we'll go ahead and do a roll call vote on the motion. Bill? Uh, yes. Chelsea? Yes. John? Yes. And I vote aye. So the, the motion passes four to zero. Did you want to? Oh. So, uh, Bill, did you have a comment or a question? He dropped off. Uh, uh, yeah, I did, but not to not to this board. It was somebody that walked into my room. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. I just wanted to be sure you you were here. So um, it looks like we're moving on to matters. And um, Claire, I guess I have the a few things to um, do, but I don't know if staff has anything first. But otherwise, I'll jump in. Oh, I. Don't believe we have any updates okay. from staff. Christopher, you can correct me if I'm forgetting something. Um, unless any members of the board has questions for us. I don't have any questions for you, but Aubrey, thank you for registering me for the National Trust for Historic Preservation Saving Places Conference. Um, I appreciate that. You're so welcome. <laughs> And you, and, you know, a shout out to staff. You're doing a great job in, in you've almost made it halfway through or you have reached the halfway point of Marcy's leave. So great job for keeping everything moving along. So I have been working on the board initiative updates, just sort of these little spreadsheets to see. And it's been fascinating because it's 
some of it simple and some of it, I realize all the issues it really does bring up. And one of the ones is, is and I think some of our hearings tonight point out the need for um, design guideline updates, and especially as it relates to technology, uh, photovoltaic arrays and all of that, you realize that all these things and technology has moved along and we have a ways to catch up with them and, and, and learn what's best practices in historic preservation and update our um, guidelines accordingly. And I don't have anything to show you tonight. And I almost sent them to Claire this morning, but I didn't think that was fair. I know her work ethic. I didn't want to burden her before this meeting tonight. But um, there, there are a lot of things that can kind of be, be grouped together, but there are really a lot of things that need some fulsome discussions and and some things like that and i'm also as i'm working on this trying to figure out what kind of staff time it would take and who out there in the community can help us with these things i was so pleased to hear um you know patrick o'rourke um once again reiterate that they're willing to support us and they'd like support from us as well as as Lynn Siegel as executive director of Historic Boulder about how best to partner and how we can move the ball forward. So stay tuned. Um, it, I got excited about it and then I also realized how many pieces there were to some of these. The other thing I wanted to share is I attended the boards and commission training on October 1st, a virtual meeting along with Brenda and, and other staff members and board members. And, the two key things I walked away with from it is there was discussion about the annual letter to council. And um, I think it was, now I'm trying to remember which staff member, I think it was John Morse who led this discussion that sometimes it will take a board two or three letters or two or three years to council asking for the same priority or to get it into council or city staff's work plan before a particular subject really does get on the radar and start um, moving along through through. Um, their policies and procedures. And I thought that was interesting. And one of the things that um, they also said, and I don't know if they were referring to Landmarks Board two years ago or another board, and they said, and some one board sent in a video um, instead of a letter, and that was really great. So I wanted to throw that out there as we get ever closer to um, a deadline for a letter or video or something to city council. Um, the other thing I had mentioned to Claire, and she was kind enough to add this to matters, is um, since 1984, Historic Boulder has been doing these holiday house tours, and um, this year it's on this Saturday, December 3rd and 4th, and in previous years, both staff members in the preservation and planning department, as well as Landmarks board members, if they're interested, have signed up to volunteer for a shift. And I'm actually going to be a house captain this year on both days. And um, so if anyone is interested, I can get more details to you about what the shifts are. Um, Previously, if you volunteered, you also got a ticket to go see the other houses. I can very quickly tell you that one of the houses featured on this year's tour is at 7th and Aurora. It's the Scott Carpenter house where his maternal grandmother lived and where he grew up and went to Boulder High and everything um, before he uh, flew into space. Um, and another house that might be on the tour is a house that the Landmarks Board, well, I believe Historic Boulder uh, submitted the landmark application and then the landmarks board supported supported it. It started out over the owner's objection, but was fully supported by the owner by the time the designation got to city council. And it's the Lebro house that is at 819 6th Street that was designed in 1954. Hobie Wagner it has a wonderful butterfly roof and um, it got saved, had a wonderful addition put onto it. It has fabulous views from the backyard of the Flatirons. So it's going to kind of be in that neighborhood west of 9th Street and more like between Aurora and that area to baseline. So that gives you just a little bit of an idea of where the neighborhood is. But, um, you know, it's, its focus is educating people on 
um, architecture and different things um, about preservation that, that um, is something I think, you know, is great for us if we have the time to volunteer for. And you can reach out to me directly if you have any questions or to Historic Boulder if you're interested. And Claire, I think that's all I have. And I don't know if other members of the board have anything. I don't see any raised hands. If no one wants to bring anything up, I think uh, we can adjourn the meeting at 9.31 p.m. Thank you, Abby. Thank you. Thank you. Right, thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank you, Abby. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.